Okay, so I've worked at the salon for about a year now. I started last June as a receptionist while I was going to hair school. To give you an idea of the building, it's four separate leases in a fairly old building. The main floor is the store, then behind the reception desk in the store there are stairs that go down to the salon. You go all the way through the salon, and you find a cement staircase going up to the top floor, where there's a clothing store that's unrelated on the second floor, and on the third floor is a spa as well as a corporate office space we use, and the staff lounge area. For the first few months there, I never really experienced anything. So this girl I used to work with, she quit several months back unrelated to this, but she was telling me some of the stuff that goes on, specifically in the spa. This is the first whiff of anything I've ever heard regarding spooky stuff at my work. So there was a new girl, starting, and she was opening the spa. You went to the spa through the back cement staircase, and the front door the guests enter through is locked from the inside. So this girl is opening the tills, and suddenly she turns and there is a slender, pale woman standing there in a red, swooping sun hat. She's obviously confused because the front is still locked, but she looks at the computer screen to see if there's an appointment booked super early, and as she is asking the woman what she's there for, she looks back up from the screen and the red hat woman is gone. The new girl apparently never came back after that shift, so apparently there is a spa ghost that many people have seen, heard, and felt, and she wears a red hat. Since starting, I've also began working in the spa. The spa is honestly really old, it's also two floors, so there is a metal spiral staircase that you can see from the reception desk that goes down to the pet station, and waxing rooms, etc. I often hear footsteps coming up the stairs only to have no one arrive at the top. The reception desk is also behind a wall, so when you're walking to the front from the back rooms you can't see anything. The spa is not super well renovated, so sound carries a lot. I've also often heard clicks on the keyboard and the mouse, then rounded the corner and no one's at the desk. To be honest, the spa lady seems real chill, I think she's just stuck. She doesn't have a negative presence, nonetheless she still makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Now let's move our focus down to the store. I usually work with my coworker and homie, and it's a common thing for us to be standing behind the desk chatting to one another, and we will hear a single footstep behind us on the stairs, and you look behind you and no one's there. Honestly, just a lot of unexplained noises go on behind us in the staircase, which is super unsettling, right? Enter the virus. We were closed for more than three months, which is the longest the salon slash spa has been closed since opening over 30 years ago. We reopened from it on May 26th, but before we were actually open, all the reception team had to come in and go back through the books and call all the guests that missed appointments due to our closure. So I worked two shifts of calling people back on the second shift. Chills. I was working with my manager and this other guy as well. So anyway, we had the salon open while we were in the store because it has the only washroom. So at one point he went downstairs to get something from the printer. I heard something behind me in the stairwell so I turned around thinking he needed a pen or something. At the same time the phone rang so I wiped around for like two seconds. Then the phone rang and so I wiped back around but my manager already picked up the phone. I turned back around to see what he needed and to my astonishment, he was way down in the salon at the printer. This confused the hell out of me because I was sure I saw his face directly behind me. For the rest of my shift, I shoved all the thoughts of it out of my head. When I got home that evening, the thought of what I saw kept coming back, and finally I came to the conclusion that I absolutely did not see my coworker's face. He's quite pale and blonde, and the man's face I saw was dark, all over just dark. So I drew his face. Needless to say, it's the scariest thing I've ever drawn. Anyways, over the next few days as the salon opens, word traveled real quick of what I saw and what I drew. Until the salon manager comes up to me and starts telling me a truly awful story of the son of the architect who had constructed the building. His name was Ryan Jenkins of Calgary, Alberta. His dad, the architect, was Dan Jenkins of Calgary, Alberta. Now, if you want to fact check me, go and Google his name. Anyway, 
Turns out Ryan had committed a horrific murder in 2009. He had married this woman in California, and through a series of events, he murdered her and mutilated her body in an effort to have the body unidentifiable. The T is that she was identified by her breast implant serial numbers. Anyway, so he actually wound up committing suicide the same week he killed her in Hope, British Columbia in a motel after he had fled across the border back to Canada. The motel manager who had found him hanging in his room described it as looking into the devil's eyes and that he would never forget that face. The salon manager tells me this story and tells me to look him up to see if I drew his face. I google his name and I immediately exited the tab. That was the face that I saw, I swear to god. So the following shift that I go in, I am chanting this in my head that I'm not scared and that I'm strong and that you can't touch me. I worked alone that day, and I heard many unpleasant things behind me, including a hand slapping at the security gate that hangs a little low between the salon and the desk. At the end of the night though, I mustered up the courage to say goodnight as I was leaving, and I heard three loud, distinct footsteps coming up the stairs, and I ran out that door. Since then, my homie and coworker and I have had the printer printing random computer mumbo jumbo that it often does like random things like hearts and filled in smiley faces and card suits like spades. We often have wondered if it's someone trying to communicate. One day we got so many on the weird computer speak, printouts, and on one page, all in caps, one word, it just reads HELP. So yeah, my work is super haunted. Uh, I saw a murderer's face in the stairwell, for some reason he's decided this is a great place to reside since his passing. And yeah, that's, uh, super duper cool. As an edit, I didn't even get into what goes on in the staff room on the top floor. Several people have been up in the staff room after the alarm has been set over in the office spaces. They've heard doors slamming, voices, light switches clicking, and one girl has even heard whistling. I've also experienced something up there where we made it mad. To be honest, looking back, this was very foolish of us but it was a slow day in the spa and a girl I work with brought tarot cards. I think we stirred up some stuff up there, because at the end of the day, we were in the staff room chatting. From the hallway, I just heard a plastic container go flying and smack into a wall. It sounded like someone threw it hard. Needless to say, we ran. The other night after work, my friend and coworker and I were grabbing a drink across the street from my work at a rooftop patio. We finished work at like 10 p.m. The sunset was really beautiful, so we were looking in the direction of work slash the sunset, and we just see a hallway light go on on the top floor. No other offices or other hallway lights came on. It also stayed on until we paid our bill. I wonder if something knew we were looking in that direction. My name is Mike, and before I tell you my story, I would like to let you guys know that I am not a man of religion. From my point of view, every video, photograph, or audio recording has a logical explanation. The only reason I keep my interest in the paranormal is because the strange things I've experienced in my childhood. Things that have recently seeped their way back into my life. I started out the first three years of my life homeless. It was just me, my brother, and my mother. My parents split up right after I was born, and neither of them could afford a house by themselves. My dad lived in his car, and my mom lived at various places for a while. Cheap holiday resorts that would help families in need, relatives, and shelters would be our go-to. My mom always made sure that my brother and I never realized the situation we were in. We were on holiday, she would tell us, in the Netherlands it wasn't weird that homeless families would stay in places like center parks outside of the holiday season. I only found out about the whole thing when she opened up about it many years later. After three years, my mom was assigned a flat in Rotterdam. It wasn't much, but we called it home. My dad had a place for himself as well, and we started spending some time with him again. My mom hated this idea, but he was still our dad. We would see him on the weekends, and we were living with our mom for the rest of the time. From that point on, it was a pretty normal life. Birthdays, game nights, playdates with other kids. Life was good. After a while, my mom started having trouble sleeping. 
she would sit on the couch in the middle of the night staring into blank space. One night I got out of bed to get some water, and she was standing in the middle of the hallway, emotionless as she looked in my direction. It was the first time I was overcome with fear because of her behavior. She would sometimes break down and think that people would come and take everything away again. I think the memories of her own childhood and years of being homeless with two kids finally had gotten the better of her. It scared me at first, but eventually it was a normal routine. I would hear noises come from the living room and a few sobs every now and then. It was heartbreaking. Fast forward three years, I was sleeping and something woke me up. I expected to hear my mom from the living room, but it was quiet. I tried to focus on the sounds I heard, and all of a sudden, a white shade shot from the bed and grabbed my throat. It was only for a moment, but it was enough to send me crying out of my room. I mean, can you blame me? I'm a grown man now, but I think my reaction would be quite similar if it would happen to me tonight. My mom ran from her bedroom and held me in her arms. I cried that something was trying to hurt me. The good mom that she was, she told me that it was just a bad dream, and that I could sleep in her bed that night so I could feel safe. I was scared, but tired enough to fall asleep. The next day, my brother came into my room and saw me laying there. He asked, did it hurt you too? We were really young, but I remember that sentence as if it was yesterday. In the following years, we would experience similar things. The idea that someone would hide in a corner, books would fall from the shelves, my mom being weird at night. It became normal for me, but my brother couldn't take it anymore. He wanted to live with my dad, because he no longer felt safe at home. And this destroyed my mother. Her nightly cries made a comeback, but this time she wasn't in some trance. It was a hard time, but for some reason the activity seemed to calm down. No longer did I feel like I was being watched at night. I can only describe it as calm. Time went by, and I would spend more time at my dad's place. I made some friends, and I had a stepbrother I got along with quite well. It wasn't long until I started to notice weird things happening. Lights would go on at night, the TV would shut off and turn back on a few minutes later. I told my brother about it because I thought he was messing with me, Then he said that whatever was haunting us in our old house followed him here. I laughed because I didn't believe in ghosts anymore. I was older, and I started rationalizing a lot of things that happened in the past. My brother, on the other hand, did not laugh with me. He told me that friends that stayed the night would go back home at night because they were scared. Some told my brother that they saw a face just inches from their own when they opened their eyes. Some would see a figure standing in the doorway. According to my brother, things got a lot worse when he left home. I asked his friends, and unfortunately, they all confirmed it. I couldn't help but feel a little paranoid after that. It seemed that everywhere my brother would go, he would take this weird stuff with him. Eight years later, he finally got into a serious relationship after he bought his first apartment. It could be unrelated, but I think he didn't want to live alone. It was the first time he didn't have anyone near, and given what he went through his whole life, I couldn't blame him. They soon had children and bought a nice family house together. As far as I know, he didn't experience any strange activity during the last six years. Unfortunately, bad news would strike him again, but this time it wouldn't be considered paranormal. In 2019, he was diagnosed with colorectal cancer. They caught it early, so he would have a piece of his colon removed. The entire second half of 2019 would be filled with fear, but we were hopeful. He had his surgery in February of 2020, and he was no longer in any real danger. I wanted to look him up, but life had another trick up its sleeve. <laughs> a worldwide pandemic. I couldn't see him for months out of fear he would catch the virus. After the year he had, I wasn't taking any chances. Then came last week. I finally got to see my brother five months after his surgery. I wanted to keep the conversation light, but our good friend Johnny Walker had other plans. I asked him what it was like to be in the situation he was in. He told me he thought about death a lot. The chances of him dying were extremely small, but you never know if the disease had spread or not. He wondered if there really was an afterlife, what would happen to him when he died. We then started talking about all the things that happened in the past and came up with a lot of reasonable theories. How the white shade was something I hallucinated and my fear took my breath away, how friends possibly heard stories and became paranoid when they were having a sleepover. It felt good to laugh about it. 
We eventually said our goodbyes and got in the car. I saw his arm waving in between the curtains while I drove off. This was funny to me, because we always made fun of my dad and stepmother when they would stand in front of their house waving us goodbye, like the end of some cheesy Christmas special. I texted him about it when I got home. Did you really just wave me goodbye? You're starting to look like dad. Five minutes after my text, I got a call from my brother. He sounded a bit frightened over the phone when he asked what I meant. When he closed the door that night, his kids started crying. He went upstairs to calm him down right after I left. His voice sounded scared and desperate when he told me that he never waved goodbye. The reasonable side of me tells me that it was a trick of light, but deep down inside I'm having a very different feeling. Was everything that we experienced as kids real? Did something really haunt my little brother wherever he went? Was this thing mocking me by waving goodbye? I really wanted to get this off my chest. I just hope that this is nothing more than a series of coincidences. I was a bit hesitant to write my story here, but this gives me some comfort in some weird way. If anyone has or has had the same experience with this, please let me know. I kind of feel like I'm being watched again. In all my years of having a deep fascination with the paranormal, such as ghosts, aliens, cryptids, and generally anything unexplained, I've only ever had one encounter that I still cannot explain. Due to a roommate bailing out on our lease, I was forced to shack up with a buddy of mine and his wife. It was a small two-bedroom apartment, but he welcomed me with open arms. They had a toddler that the second room was for, but they said she never goes in there and she sleeps with them every night, so it was no problem to take the room for my own. A couple of weeks went by with no incident, however, I did notice the room was a good 10 degrees cooler than the rest of the house at all times. No problem, I'll just wrap myself up in blankets. I've always been a heavy sleeper, so it takes me some time to wake up in the morning as I zombie around for the good first hour. One particular night, I woke up out of my sleep and lifted my head to adjust the pillow. As soon as I did, I noticed something in the far corner of the room. The entire room was lit with moonlight except for one dark silhouette of a human form standing in the corner, staring at me. This figure had no features besides the dark outlining of a broad-shouldered man standing and watching. It may have been the grogginess, but he was very tall as well, with his head almost touching the ceiling. Due to being 90% still asleep, I didn't acknowledge what I had seen and fell back asleep on my newly adjusted pillow. The next morning, I awoke to a much brighter sunlit room, and I remembered what I saw last night in the form standing in my room. After a quick glance at the corner, I shrugged it off as a dream and went on with my life. A couple more months went by with no shadowy figures staring at me, or at least that I was consciously aware of, and I was going to be moving to my new place with my then-girlfriend. We were just waiting for the lease to start. One night during that wait, I encountered the silhouetted man one more time. The details of this encounter were exactly the same. I awoke, adjusted my pillow, saw the giant shadow staring at me, thought nothing of it, and drifted back to sleep. Once again, to repeat my encounter to the letter, I awoke the next morning remembering what I saw and quickly darted my eyes to the corner. Okay, there has to be something to this. Moving day arrived, and I decided to tell my buddy who was gracious enough to let me stay of my two encounters with the silhouette. His reaction surprised me. Yeah, our daughter doesn't go in there and just points to the room saying scary man, scary man when she gets close to it. He told me, as if it was no big deal. After letting out a sarcastic, Oh, now you tell me. We continued with the move. I've never had a ghost experience before or after that, and this is my one little talking point to others who are interested in the same paranormal stories as I am. His presence has always stuck in my mind, though. I even put him in one of my short horror stories when I first started writing. Of course, that story is fictional. This one, however, is not. In 
In all my years of having a deep fascination with the paranormal, such as ghosts, aliens, cryptids, and generally anything unexplained, I've only ever had one encounter that I still cannot explain. Due to a roommate bailing out on our lease, I was forced to shack up with a buddy of mine and his wife. It was a small two-bedroom apartment, but he welcomed me with open arms. They had a toddler that the second room was for, but they said she never goes in there and she sleeps with them every night, so it was no problem to take the room for my own. A couple of weeks went by with no incident, however, I did notice the room was a good 10 degrees cooler than the rest of the house at all times. No problem, I'll just wrap myself up in blankets. I've always been a heavy sleeper, so it takes me some time to wake up in the morning as I zombie around for the good first hour. One particular night, I woke up out of my sleep and lifted my head to adjust the pillow. As soon as I did, I noticed something in the far corner of the room. The entire room was lit with moonlight except for one dark silhouette of a human form standing in the corner, staring at me. This figure had no features besides the dark outlining of a broad-shouldered man standing and watching. It may have been the grogginess, but he was very tall as well, with his head almost touching the ceiling. Due to being 90% still asleep, I didn't acknowledge what I had seen and fell back asleep on my newly adjusted pillow. The next morning, I awoke to a much brighter sunlit room, and I remembered what I saw last night in the form standing in my room. After a quick glance at the corner, I shrugged it off as a dream and went on with my life. A couple more months went by with no shadowy figures staring at me, or at least that I was consciously aware of, and I was going to be moving to my new place with my then-girlfriend. We were just waiting for the lease to start. One night during that wait, I encountered the silhouetted man one more time. The details of this encounter were exactly the same. I awoke, adjusted my pillow, saw the giant shadow staring at me, thought nothing of it, and drifted back to sleep. Once again, to repeat my encounter to the letter, I awoke the next morning remembering what I saw and quickly darted my eyes to the corner. Okay, there has to be something to this. Moving day arrived, and I decided to tell my buddy, who was gracious enough to let me stay, of my two encounters with the silhouette. His reaction surprised me. Yeah, our daughter doesn't go in there and just points to the room saying scary man, scary man when she gets close to it. He told me as if it was no big deal. After letting out a sarcastic, oh, now you tell me, we continued with the move. I've never had a ghost experience before or after that, and this is my one little talking point to others who are interested in the same paranormal stories as I am. His presence has always stuck in my mind, though. I even put him in one of my short horror stories when I first started writing. Of course, that story is fictional. This one, however, is not. I was 22 years old and just moved in with my cousin. We had a band, so of course we tried to party hard. That being said, we always had a house full of bandmates hanging out. One spring night, we were done practicing and chilling in the living room. I was sitting on the couch across from my cousin, who was passed out in his recliner. All of a sudden, he springs up from his recliner, looks at me, and says, We've got to go to the train trestle now. The train trestle was an old, abandoned, torn-up railroad track that led to a wooden, still-intact bridge over the river. We grew up in a small South Carolina town, and there wasn't much to do, so we would go hang out at places like that to drink and hang out. Back to that night when my cousin sprang up and said we've got to go to the trestle now, I thought maybe he was joking or just really baked, but he kept saying it and was dead serious. The trestle was 30 minutes away, and it had to be after midnight, but this was so crazy that I had to go. So we start heading out the door, and all of our friends outside smoking asked where the hell we were going. I told them what my cousin said, and they couldn't pass it up either. So around six of us piled into my cousin's 93 red Ford Bronco, and headed out. The 30-minute ride to the trestle was completely silent, except for a few drunken what-the-hell-are-we-doings, 
My cousin kept saying, I don't know, I just feel like we've got to go. We turn down the gravel road that leads to the abandoned train trestle, follow it up for like half a mile, make a left turn, and we're looking at the trestle about our 11 o'clock vantage point. We all get out of the Bronco and walk toward the bridge. We don't even make it 10 steps when a faint light appears in the distance, and it just keeps getting brighter. The light keeps coming and now is crossing the bridge. I remember one of my friends fearfully asking, what the hell is going on? The light keeps getting brighter and brighter, and then I finally comprehend what I'm seeing. It's a train. The train was bright white slash gray, completely silent and passing from our right to left within 20 yards. Then out of nowhere, the train slows to a stop. At this point, I'm in such disbelief that all I can do is stare. I know I sound crazy, but I swear the next thing that happens is people start walking off the train. They're wearing what appeared to my 20-year-old brain to be old clothing. I remember top hats on the men who are grabbing the bags and women in big dresses departing the cars. Next, it gets a little fuzzy because it's been 17 years, but the people just slowly vanish and the completely silent train starts moving again and slowly disappears to our left. After the train disappears, we were in complete shock and the reality sets in. We start freaking out and trying to figure out what the hell just happened. I can't remember who yelled it, but someone screamed, let's get the hell out of here. We all bolted to the Bronco and tore out of there. 17 years later, and honestly, I remember it like it was yesterday. I had a friend who lived on the other side of town that I would normally go over and hang out with. We would smoke, drink, you name it, so every now and then I would crash at his place, but every time I did, I would get this weird feeling like I was being watched, or if I'm like in the bathroom, like someone was in there with me. Usually I would just ignore it or just think I'm tripping out, something like that. So one particular night I was over, I decided to crash just because I didn't want to walk the 30-ish minutes back to my place. I'm also pretty lazy sometimes. So I spent the night, and during the middle of the night I woke up hearing footsteps, but just figured it was someone heading to the bathroom or something, so I went back to sleep. It never occurred to me that those footsteps were coming from inside his room, and not near his folk's room or his sibling's room. The next morning I wake up, my underwear had a burn hole in them, kind of near one of the cheeks, at which point I'm pissed, thinking my friends are playing a trick on me, and he was legit so confused as to what had happened. Oddly enough, it was just my underwear, not my shorts, which I was wearing when I was sleeping, so he offers to buy me a new pair, still confused. I just tell him whatever and go home. Some time passes, and my buddy is deciding to move to a new place a little further down the way, an hour and a half walk away from my place instead of the 30 minutes, so I go over with some other friends of ours and help him move. That move lasted a total of four days, it was a lot of crap, and during the last day of the move, the oven door slams open and then shut, and out of the corner of all of our eyes, we see a shadow run up the staircase, at which point we were all freaking out and deciding to hurry up the move and get the hell out of there. We later talked about it, and he claimed that he had never experienced anything like that while he was living there, so he was just as dumbfounded as to what happened. At which point we just move on and get his new place all set up. After he got settled into his new place, he said things like, Man, I sleep a lot better here than at my old place. I didn't really put two and two together that his old place was really haunted. I never much believed in that kind of stuff, so I leave his new place and along my walk home, I'm going to pass by his old place. I decide to take one last look into his old place and just <laughs> reminisce about all the fun memories we had. I suddenly see a shadow of a tall man walk from the hallway into his living room and then toward the window. I was looking into and then just vanish, at which point I'm like, screw this. I ran all the way home terrified. Now whenever I walk home from there, I purposely avoid that house. This happened a couple of years ago, early on in my relationship with my husband. He was a bit of a partier. 
He didn't have too much regard for other people's needs, nor their safety if their needs somehow got in front of his once. If we were out at a club, and I worked the next morning, he would become furious if I made him leave early, and early being 2am. Luckily, he has since grown as a human, and finally has a sense of decency about him. And I think this event may be why. The night this happened, we had visited with a couple close friends of his at a club in Chicago. I had just started a new medication, so I wasn't sure how alcohol would interact with it, and I chose not to drink. He, on the other hand, decided to do ecstasy. Totally fine by me. I was designated driver so he could do what he wanted. A little into the night, my partner and I sat down, and a young lady sat beside him. She was foreign, and I noticed she was more touchy than American women were. This didn't bother me at first, I've never been the jealous type. She was being silly and had her hand on his knee, moving closer to... you know. This began making me uncomfortable because I noticed he wasn't saying anything, and me being overly polite, I didn't want to cause drama, so I also said nothing. I didn't know how to respond to such a situation. I looked up near the bar and sighed out of frustration, but kept a positive expression. And this is when I noticed him, a young man in his 20s, wearing a white shirt with black dots. He was sitting in the chair, his body pointed straight toward me. He had a blank stare as he watched me, and I immediately felt the vibe and felt unsafe. My gut told me he was staring way too intently at me, and it wasn't normal. Back to my husband, the young lady got up and left. I mentioned that if a man sat next to me and put his hand near my crotch, he would have most likely decked him. I said it was unfair to make me feel so awkward in a situation like that, and in the future to please be more aware because, being well-natured, I'm not one to create fights with strangers over silly things. Being a bit under the influence, he took this as me being jealous and controlling him, of course, his response was a not-so-nice dismissal of what I said. Frustration growing, I glanced up and sitting across from me was the guy. He was still staring at me, reading the situation. Becoming angry and feeling strange because of this guy, I asked my husband if we could relocate. He had to use the bathroom, so up we went. I stood alone at another bar in the club and waited for him to return. Looking around, and who do I see? Of course... That dude was now at this bar, staring with zero expression. I began to have a sinking feeling in my gut because he was just not normal. I subtly gave him the can I help you expression, but looked away before I could see his reply. Once my partner returned, I calmly asked him the chances we would call it a night. It was nearing 1am and I had to work in the morning. I knew this would cause some type of drama, and it did. He immediately thought I had wanted to leave due to my jealousy issue. This was not the case at all, inside I truly felt unsafe, but refused to say anything because I knew my partner might fly off the handle with this dude. Had I misread the body language of the dude, my mistake could lead to him being hurt. I glanced and he was still staring, so I asked to relocate again. We did and my boyfriend was becoming more and more intoxicated. His body language was more and more irritated by me. Finally, I was feeling horrible, between a rock and a hard place. Here was the man who I felt needed to protect me, and yet he stood before me making me feel terrible. No matter where in the club we went, I noticed the dude with the dotted shirt. He would get closer and closer to us, watching the tension between my partner and I. Finally, I threw in the towel. I said screw it and decided to go. Like an idiot, I decided to leave the club and walk to my car alone. It was around 3am now, and I was just mentally drained. The guy who followed me around inside the club wasn't in my mind as I walked outside. Leaning up against the building, I looked at my phone to route how to walk back to my car. 15 minute walk in high heeled boots. Great, I thought. I looked up to start my journey, and wouldn't you know it, across maybe 10 feet from me was this dude. He leaned against the light pole, staring and grinning. Without a single word, I immediately walked back to get into the club. I was stopped and told I couldn't re-enter. I looked at the bouncer with my pointing eyes and said, That guy's been following me. 
My partners in the club, please let me back in. I don't feel safe. Thankfully, they allowed me back in. I found my partner and just about freaked out at him. My politeness was gone. And I began venting about what I was going through, about how he was willing to let me walk to my car alone because he wanted to party. I told him how selfish this was, how I could have been attacked. To my amazement, he hugged me and apologized profusely. Luckily, he grew up that night and life has since been good. My dad grew up on a forestry in Queensland, Australia, as the son of a forest ranger. My whole life, we've spent a lot of time out in that forest, camping and driving through parts of the forestry that only rangers would travel, and only occasionally. One place that Dad loved to take us was a little farm in the middle of the forest that was impossible to find if you didn't know the way. Locals knew the place as Spike's Hut. Spike was a local farmer who had lived there for decades up until the 90s, and had a reputation for being abrasive, violent, bigoted, and not concerned with the laws of men. He had a habit of approaching guys in bars who were wearing earrings and tearing them straight out. And there were a few stories about people who displeased him and disappearing. Basically, Spike was not a nice guy, and his farm and hut reflected that pretty well. Dad would take us out there every time we visited the forest, and the hut would be more and more dilapidated, but the vibe was always the same. That straight-up feeling of just being watched, even though Spike was long gone. As I got older, I became more aware of the signs of life in the place when we went to visit. There would be 44-gallon drums full of smashed beer bottles, fire pits with reasonably fresh coal. Someone was definitely out there. God knows why, since the place was literally a snake pit at that point, but Dad didn't seem concerned. One trip when I was a teenager got strange really quick. My friend and I were all piled into my Dad's 4x4, and we were driving through the bush to Spike's so... Dad could tell his scary Spike story and freak us out. We drove onto the property, and something immediately caught my eye. Up on the hill opposite Spike's hut, there was what appeared to be a cowboy slumped against a log, hat over his face, and taking a nap. Something about his body position looked unnatural and uncomfortable. It wasn't the way you'd be sat if you were taking a casual nap in the middle of a workday. And even if it was, there was no reason for anyone to be out there. The farm was long defunct, and there was no forest business to be taken care of on the property. I pointed it out to my dad, and instead of letting us out of the car at Spikes, as he usually did, he said he wanted to keep driving through the farm to show us something. He maintained that it was nothing, but that if the figure was still there when we came back, then we'd stop and check it out. Of course, whatever he wanted to show us seemed totally made up as he just drove through the forest a bit. And when we came back, I spotted the slumped-over cowboy again, never having moved an inch. Still in that same unnatural position. I yelled out to Dad to stop, reminding him of his promise, but instead he acted like he couldn't hear me, locked the truck doors, and drove off the farm much faster than he ever drove on those dirt forest roads. My friends and I all looked at each other in confusion, but we knew that when it came to this area, questioning my dad was futile at best, dangerous at worst. Dad denied that any of the events that day ever happened after that, but my friends and I were still curious about what was going on out there, so a few months later we went camping on our own and set out to find Spike's hut. It took hours of driving through the forest to find the gate to Spike's property, but eventually we found it without Dad's help. Something was off once we got there, more so than usual that day, though. My mates jumped out of the car but were suddenly frozen, not wanting to walk any closer to the hut, for no visible reason. The vibe was just wrong that day, and it felt like we had walked into something that did not belong to us. 
The tug in my gut to get out was strong, but I'd spent two hours finding the place and I was gonna explore it, damn it. One of my friends acted brave and walked from the car to the hut with me, quietly acknowledging more and more signs of inhabitants with knowing nods between us. We said nothing to the others, but we were on high alert. It felt like someone could be back any minute or that they had never left and were watching us as we poked around the debris. We walked up to the side of the hut to find a kind of small shed with three walls. I heard my friend's voice go squeaky as he called me over to look inside. On the ground was a huge pile of ashes from what looked like a cooking fire, and confirming this was the present of a giant makeshift grill made from cross-hatched wire sitting over the fire, hinged to the shed wall. As I'm looking at this setup, I figure that whoever has been here has been hunting and cooking large chunks of their kill over the fire. Pretty clever, actually. But then my stomach dropped. As my eyes traveled from the grill to the ground, I saw a baby's sock. Tiny, pink, and terribly out of place, and then another, then a shirt, then a ribbon from a child's hair. All of this sitting right beside the ashes on the ground, next to a women's weekly Christmas cookbook. That's when the alarm bells in my head went off and I rounded up my mates to get out of there. Some ranger or crazy old bushy hanging out at that trashed hut was one thing, but there was absolutely no reason for a baby to be out there. And there's no way anything good had come of having a child's clothes right by a huge fire and grill. When we got back to the campground, we couldn't shake the rotten feeling of being watched, and all of us were so unsettled that we just packed up our shit and decided not to stay the night. When I got home, I told my dad about it, and he just shook it off, saying weird stuff happens out there. Being young and dumb, I never thought to look up missing persons in the area in an attempt to either explain the cowboy or the kid's clothing. But I can tell you that I will never make the mistake of going out to Spikes without my father ever again. Since the moment I started working at this restaurant six months ago, the alleyway behind the restaurant has always given me an uncomfortable feeling. To gain a layout of this restaurant, it's located in the middle of downtown, five minutes from the Mexican-United States border since we're located in the tip of Texas in the Rio Grande Valley. The alley itself is not located right behind the establishment. You must walk past its patio, then past our garage, until you reach the side back door that you have to prop open, as the door locks behind you once it's closed. During the day, I usually see people walking back and forth across the alley when I go to take out the trash. It's typically a safe location, though it is also prominent for its homeless population. They're usually harmless, despite a few that are noticeably mentally ill. My colleagues have even gotten to know a few and have given leftovers whenever possible. I work as a part of the kitchen staff at this restaurant, and most of the time will work past 10pm. At night, my boss usually never lets the women take out the trash just to be safe, especially a petite 5-foot Hispanic 28-year-old female. Anyway, since the quarantine started, our kitchen staff has become quite small, so I'll usually help take out the trash with one of the other men working. This night was pretty slow, and my fellow co-workers and I were encouraged to clean up and leave early. At around a quarter to ten, I decided to get two of the slightly full trash bags and take them out back myself, assuming someone will see my actions and take the other two after me. As I walked past the patio to the garage, my gut began to fluster. I got to the back door and paused. Well, maybe you should wait, I told myself, but the smell protruding from the bags was nauseating. I pushed the door open and propped it open with a brick we usually kept nearby. The alley was dark and silent, the air felt menacing. The only light illuminating was from the bulb above the door. I walked quickly to the bins and lifted up the top and dumped the trash. Then, slowly, a man stood up from the other side of the dumpster. He wasn't very big, but he looked a lot older. He was sweating, but his demeanor seemed agitated. 
he must have been crouching and waiting for some time. I jumped back holding my hand above my heart and seemed to be pulsing through my chest. The man looked at me, eyeing me as my steps moved backwards. He shook his head, motioning for me to stop. He was far too close for me to outrun him. I looked at his bushy dark brows and dark black eyes. Most of him was still cloaked in the night that surrounded us. His clothes did not look homeless, but I still assumed he was since it was common for them to be out here at this hour, usually waiting for food. I told him I didn't have any leftovers, but he shook his head again and took out a medium-sized knife. My eyes widened as I took in a breath. The following exchange took place in Spanish, but I'll translate it. I don't have my purse. I was working. I'm still working. Just come with me, he said, using his knife as a pointer. My mouth grimaced, having no idea where this small amount of courage came from. I said, My friend is coming right now with the rest of the trash. No, come now, he said more hurriedly, and stepped closer. I stepped back again. Speaking again with a little more tenacity, They all saw me come over here. There's more trash, and he's coming right now. He's outside right now. I just need to yell. You are not going to scream or I'll gut you. To this day, I don't know what came over me, but I replied with, Watch me. We looked at each other, daring each other, and then we both heard footsteps coming from inside the garage, and he ran past me. I stood there, breathing again. I didn't even know I was holding my breath. I turned to see my friend John come out the door. Hey, we're almost done over... He stopped after seeing my face. And what happened? I explained everything as tears ran down my cheeks. My friend decided to run down the alley and try to catch him, even though I told him not to, and that he was gone by then. It was about five minutes until he came back. John relayed to me that no one was around except for some homeless guys we were familiar with. He asked them if they saw anyone running from the alleyway, and they said yeah, but they didn't recognize the man, and he took off in the opposite direction towards the border. John took me back inside and told our boss what happened. They called the cops, whose station was pretty close by. They sent someone to patrol the area and gather a description for me, which I gave. My boss let me leave early, and John walked me to my car. He told me it's too bad we don't keep a camera back there. It would have been cool to see how I handled the guy. I had smiled slightly, but my stomach was still in knots. He looked at me and apologized. I moved my hand to stop him and told him I'd be fine. Unfortunately, I still work there, but I've been excused from trash duty from now on. Obviously, they never found him. I I don't want to think about what would have happened to me if I was more complicit. Something gave me the courage to argue back to him, and thank goodness that my friend came just in time, so... Man that was waiting behind the dumpster, I hope we never meet again. When I was a junior in college, I went camping with four friends in Bald Eagle State Park in Pennsylvania. We had reserved a campsite that was pretty remote and pretty deep in the park, way up on one of the mountains, not near any of the other campsites. It was located at the end of a narrow dirt road, maybe about 75 feet long, which itself broke off from the main road, which I think was also dirt. There was nothing at the end of the little road but our campsite. We parked at the entrance to the park and spent the day hiking up to the site, setting up camp and then hiking around. We made a fire, made dinner, and then we turned in. Not long after, we discovered that one of the guys with us snored. Loudly. Like walls of the tent shaking snores, truly deafening stuff. After probably half an hour or so, the rest of us gave up on trying to sleep and climbed out of our tents, leaving our loud friend snoring away in his. My friend at the time was a DJ for our school's radio station, and she had a late night show. I think she was on between midnight and 2am. Since we couldn't sleep, we trekked up to the main road where the reception was better and where we could actually be able to hear the radio over his snores. When we got to the road, we stood in a loose circle near the entrance to our site. As we stood there, 
A black pickup truck with its lights off appeared out of the woods and passed us. Very slowly. It was unmarked, not a ranger. We listened to the radio for maybe half an hour or 45 minutes after that, and even briefly called in to say hi. And finally, though, we decided to head back to bed. One of the girls went off into the woods to take care of some things while I climbed back into the tent that I shared with her and got into my bag. After a couple of minutes, I heard her moving through the leaves toward the tent, coming from my right. At the same time, I also heard the unmistakable rumble of tires on the ground. I stood up and looked out of the little screen window on the tent. We hadn't bothered to put the rain fly up as it was a perfectly clear night with a very bright moon so I could see everything. I saw my friend come sprinting back to the tent and duck behind it just as the black truck pulls into our campsite, still with its headlights off, and then it shuts off the engine and just sits there. Our friend is still snoring. I have a little knife in my tent, and I know my other two friends have at least one in theirs, but we have no other weapons, no guns or bear spray, so we just watch. As I said, it's a clear night and I can see the truck just fine. It's maybe 20 feet away from my tent, but I can't see who's in the truck or how many people there are. Nothing seems to move inside the truck. I still remember the metallic clunk sound as the engine cools off. I honestly have no idea how long I just watched it. My friend had ducked down behind our tent, and I could hear by her breathing that she was terrified, but neither of us said a word. It feels like a really long time had gone by. It had to be at least ten minutes, but it could have been half an hour or more. We just kept waiting for something to happen, but nothing did. Eventually, the truck started up again and then backed up down the long, narrow dirt road. It never turned its headlights on, and I heard it drive back in the direction it had originally come from, and that was it. My friend burst into the tent a second later, and now we're talking, oh, Did you see that? Holy shit! Oh my god! But our friend is still asleep. Eventually, we just went to bed. We packed up and headed out in the morning as we planned, and yes, we checked with the park and they do not own any black unmarked SUVs, nor did any ranger come to check out our site in the middle of the night. Here is a story that I thought was gone for so long, but recently made an appearance. Beware, it's a long read. Growing up, I, 25 female, lived with my mom, dad, and two older brothers. We lived in a house that was built in the mid-70s or early 80s. We always felt there was something more to that house. I would always talk about someone that I would call the Shadow Man. My first experience with this entity was when I was about five or six. I had woken up one night to use the bathroom, which was located in the exact center of a long hallway that led to the living room, kitchen, etc. I opened my door and stepped out. I remember feeling terrified, staring at the darkened hallway. Everyone was asleep and the house was dark. It was properly close to 3 a.m., I could see this tall, dark figure standing at the end of the hallway and watching me. I was frozen with fear. My dad was pretty tall himself, 6'4", but he was also pretty heavy. This thing was as tall as the ceiling and skinny with long arms. This thing crouched down to my level and charged at me. I screamed and woke everyone up. I was so scared that I refused to sleep alone for nearly a year. So one night, when I was about seven, I was sleeping on the love seat my parents had in their bedroom. It was located by the door to the hallway and parallel to the master bathroom. I woke up and my body was numb. I couldn't move, I couldn't talk, I could only stare. And this was my first experience with sleep paralysis. I laid on the couch staring at the tall, skinny, dark figure that stood in front of the bedroom door by my feet. 
I tried to call for my dad, but I couldn't. I was stuck. I felt like I was suffocating. Suddenly, my dad yells out. He sleep talks a lot. Leave her alone, get out. I quickly sit up and jump from the couch to my parents' bed, waking both of them up. I laid between my parents trying to go back to sleep, but I couldn't. I could see the shadow man walk from the door to the bathroom and then to the closet located next to my dad. My dad started mumbling like he was having a nightmare and suddenly woke up. He got up to use the bathroom, but before he did, he opened and turned on the closet light. He thought I was sleeping, but really, I was wide awake. So through the course of about 11 years, I would wake up about a few minutes before 3am in sleep paralysis, and he would always be there, hanging out in the corner of the dark room I was in. It didn't happen all the time, but enough to have me scared of the dark until my teen years. So, fast forward to my sophomore year of high school. We had since moved out of that house, and I hadn't seen or dreamt about the Shadow Man in years. So one night, I sneak out with some friends, and we went to this abandoned house on my friend's street. We take acid, and my friend starts spray-painting the walls. I was feeling my trip. We were jamming out, smoking a joint, when I suddenly got that chill. The one that told me that he was there. I don't remember most of my trip, so sorry, but I do remember seeing the shadow man poke his head out from around the corner and I screamed. My friends made fun of me the next day, telling me I was freaking out because the shadow man was watching. After that, I hadn't seen or felt him. I met my fiancé, we moved in together, and all was happy. It had been years since that night and I thought to myself, finally he screwed off. So one night, this happened last year, my fiancé and I moved our bed to the living room. We did this a lot, because we would always pass out in the living room watching TV or movies that we were sleeping in, and I had this dream that I was sleeping in my old room. I turned to look at my fiancé and he was in my bed, sound asleep. I tried to get up and was hit with sleep paralysis. I tried to stay calm as I knew I was dreaming and I would wake up soon until I glanced at the corner. And there he was, standing and watching. I felt so scared I couldn't breathe. I looked back at the ceiling telling myself to wake up. I could see the ceiling of the apartment but the walls were of my old bedroom. I was trying desperately to nudge my fiancé to wake him up but I was frozen and felt intense pressure all over. Finally, after what felt like hours, I was able to move my hand just a smudge and touched his back. The second my hand made contact with him, I was snapped back into reality and sat up gasping and whimpering. The last incident to happen was about two months ago. I was sleeping and started dreaming that I was in a taxi going somewhere. I couldn't see the taxi driver as he was just a mass of pitch black. The taxi suddenly went off-road and headed toward the woods. I tried to get out, but the driver reached back and placed his hand in the center of my chest. I opened my eyes, and I could still see the taxi in the trees, but behind that was my bedroom. The figure was turned and staring at me with his hand still on my chest, pinning me in place. I was freaking out. Now, my bedroom was more visible, but still I was stuck. I couldn't move, couldn't talk. My whole body still asleep, but my mind and my eyes were wide awake. I started to whimper and my fiancé turned and threw his arm over me. I started crying when he did this because the pressure intensified. The dark figure was leaning closer and closer until we hit a tree. When we did, I shot up, gasping and crying. He woke up instantly and was trying to calm me down, but I was terrified. I was able to go back to sleep after an hour or so. After that, and to this day, I'll see a smudge of darkness pass by out of the corner of my eye. Maybe he's still following me. Well, maybe he can properly piss off. One day, my wife brought home a stone statue of the face of Buddha. She was given it by a man while she was throwing out trash at work. The man exclaimed that he wanted to get rid of it, but he'd feel bad about throwing it away, 
given his religious beliefs. So, my wife took it home with her because she thought it was cool and would serve as a nice decoration. Not long after, the air in the apartment began to feel more dense and being alone felt more menacing. I'm currently out of work right now, so while my wife is at work, I often try to take naps to pass the time. I began to start hearing faint whispers in my room while I tried to sleep, and at times, it felt like there were full-blown conversations being had by two separate voices. This was not new to me, however. Since I was young, I've considered myself sensitive to feeling and sometimes hearing things. I've had instances in the past where I'd hear my name being repeated over and over while I tried to sleep, for months at a time. Once, while coming back in from a smoke, I heard music and laughter in my mother's apartment during a silent part in a song being played in my headphones. This happened while no one was in the home, and not a single device was on inside the house. Anyways, since having the Buddha face in my apartment, I've heard whispers. I can never make out what is being said, or the gender of the voice speaking. But something was there. I could feel it deep in my bones. These occurrences would always be accompanied by other strange happenings as well. A few times I heard my bedroom door being pushed open, as if something was peering in. I'd slowly open one of my eyes and see that the door, however, was closed. Other times, I'd hear something in another room, or even in my own room, fall over without any explanation. I do have an active imagination and watch a lot of horror-related videos and movies often. So there were plenty of times during this where I chopped all of this up to just that, my imagination. However, the past few days, I've had an overwhelming sense of dread lingering in my room whenever I'm alone, and even sometimes when my wife is asleep. The whispers started to come more frequently. I put two and two together and hypothesized that it could be connected to the Buddha statue, given that it was the only new variable in our lives. I told my wife everything, and she agreed that we should go to our local Goodwill and just get rid of it. So later that night, we put it in the trunk of her car, and all of a sudden, I'm compelled to curse at it. This is especially odd because I'm not a confrontational person whatsoever. I don't challenge people, let alone spirits in the unknown. My wife looks at me in confusion and mouths the word, no, because taunting whatever could be bothering us was definitely not the right idea. I brushed off my random compulsion as just heavy emotion and began to get in the car, when suddenly I saw a figure appear in front of her headlights and pass by my door. It was maybe 5 foot 10 and completely gray in color with absolutely zero features. It flew by me so fast, yet... I felt as if I looked at it for nearly an entire minute as I studied its physique and its movements. Its entire body looked as if it weighed maybe 50 pounds, if it was a living person, with its arms and legs being as thick as small branches. Its arms were in a position as if they were posed to run like an athlete on a track. There were no sharp edges that I could see on this thing, only rounded out ends. My head never moved from the position it was in to see it during that quick second. And the weirdest part of that experience was that I'm mostly blind in my right eye, yet I saw it perfectly through that blind eye, clear as day. When it left my view, I instantly was given a massive headache and extreme nausea followed by a massive anxiety attack. I was absolutely frozen in fear knowing what I just witnessed. My wife looked over at me and asked me what was wrong and I couldn't even speak. For a minute or so, I couldn't even blink. I had just witnessed the spirit come from my apartment and go to the back of the car where the Buddha statue was placed. If anyone has any thoughts on this, let me know, because anything would be helpful. I really don't know what it is about me or the house I've lived in my whole life, but I have always had really weird and creepy experiences around it. When I was little, 
I used to constantly wake up in the middle of the night with this feeling that someone was in the same room as me, which led me to sleeping with the lights on. One night I woke up feeling like that with chills through my entire body. When I looked across the room to the door, it was semi-open, and I saw this figure standing there. It was like it had a dark hood and these bright eyes. The thing is, it wasn't a glimpse and it wasn't dark. I remember that I spent about a full minute staring at it, not knowing what to do until I started unconsciously praying, and it went away. That happened a few nights in a row, until I couldn't sleep at all, but got braver and madder about it. So one night, when it was there again staring at me, I was shaking and scared, but I screamed at it, telling it to go away, that I wouldn't let it make me go insane, literally feeling crazy for talking to a figure while praying for it to leave. I have a lot of other things like this that have been happening to me, and when I tell them to people, they just never believe me. I was maybe 15 years old, and I'm 28 now. My grandpa had passed away a few weeks before this event. Grandpa was an old Italian fella and had lots of old 1920s style clothing, coats, hats, and the vests, and he was just the toughest old SOB you'd ever met. Old World War II Navy vet. So my dad brings home a bunch of grandpa's old clothes leaves them on his bed, and says I can pick out any clothes that I want to keep. Mom and Dad leave to go pick up some more stuff, and I felt kind of weird, but I thought I'd try. So I'm in my parents' bedroom trying on some coats and stuff. Grandpa was a small guy, and I was pretty tall, so most things were almost close to fitting me. And at the time, they all just seemed kind of goofy. But in reality, looking back on it, they were very nice clothes. Grandpa liked to dress well. I go to the bed and grab another item to try on. A tan overcoat. Real 1920s gangster style. I put this jacket on and it instantly just felt right. You know that feeling you get when you put on an item of clothing that you feel really confident in? That's what this jacket felt like. And I hadn't even seen it on my body yet. So I grabbed some old hat to go with it and walked into the bathroom to see it in the mirror. So I'm standing in the mirror looking at my reflection. Coat actually fits really nicely. I look down at the hat in my hand to dust it off a bit, look up at my reflection, and then I freeze. This is not my reflection. I mean, I know it is my reflection. I know I'm in front of a mirror and I know my surroundings are my parents' bathroom, but the face that's looking back at me is not mine. It was a very odd but reassuring feeling. I just felt like I knew it was my grandpa looking back at me. So I'm just frozen, standing there, staring back at this face that I know without a doubt belonged to my grandfather. Was there for what felt like a couple seconds and suddenly the face becomes mine again, and I feel sad. I had felt odd, kinda eerie, looking back at a different face. But as soon as it was over, those feelings were replaced by sadness. I was just feeling a lot of emotions at that point. I was not super close with my grandpa, but seeing my dad go through the loss was really hard. My eyes well up and a tear falls from my cheek onto the lapel of the coat. I felt a slight pressure onto the front of the jacket, almost like someone was gently smoothing it out across the lapels. Again, I have no idea how to really explain it. I just felt so sure that it was him getting me all straightened up, and it made me feel better. I kept the coat, still have it to this day, and every once in a while, especially on an emotional day, like my wedding day, I feel like he is there again. Never feels malicious. Just feels like he's making sure my tie is on straight and I'm doing all right. And 
And this experience happened to my little sister, who was now female and 16 years old, when she was three years old. I learned of it yesterday after my dad, her, and I sat in the living room of our late maternal grand-aunt Eugenia's house, and were reminiscing about the old times, back when most of our grandparents were alive and living in this three-apartment building, and how fun it was to meet for lunch and breakfast with them, and in general having them and the cousins from Australia around. Those were the best family summers in mine and my sister's memories, and slowly the conversation shifted into the paranormal sightings our family has gone through, since the women in both sides of the family have some sort of gifts. Dad started sharing his ghost sightings when my sister hesitantly shared this. Please note that at the time of the event it was late in the afternoon, and I was present, but I was eight years old, and I did notice that my sister was behaving weirdly, but was too busy eating ice cream. The experience goes like this. She was three years old, and she was too bored to walk on her feet, so she started to crawl and pretend to be a dog, barking at our grandma's house when she met them in the hallway towards the first kitchen. Yes, we have two kitchens and two bathrooms. When my sister grabbed some water and then stole some pie from the fridge, and then went to the second kitchen to grab a plate. As she was eating, she saw Grand Aunt Eugenia, and she was scolded for eating dessert before dinner. Defeated, my sister returns to the living room and conjoined dining room and saw the rocking chair by the second terrace's door. It was moving and an old man dressed in a tuxedo and smoking a cigar was sitting in it, rocking back and forth while smoking. My sister recalls she had crawled to him and barked at him, which caused him to laugh at her and motioned for her to sit next to him. My sister then asked him who he was, and he says that he was our grand-uncle Takis, and he was just watching his siblings and nieces and nephews, and now his grand-nieces and grand-nephews. She sat by him for a while, and she played with some leaves that had blown in by the open window and terrace doors all around the house, when she asked him why none of our grandparents introduced him to us. He said that he didn't need to be introduced, and that he knew all of us, and that he had been watching us. Then my sister stood up and said goodbye to him because she wanted to come outside to play with me. She then said she looked for him around the house but couldn't find him. She asked around about Grand Uncle Takis, and everyone ignored her or said there was no one with that name. And flash forward to last year, when my sister and our mom were going through some old documents and photos, when my sister found a photo taken in 1957, and it showed that he was actually the eldest son of maternal great-grandma, and he had died from cancer in that very same chair in 1958. His real name was Christophorus Thomas Bozanekis, and he was Grand-Uncle Themios, actual name Ethemios, the male equivalent of the name Eva, his older brother. All my life, I felt very uncomfortable sitting in that chair because I felt as if I was intruding. I just wanted to share this. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Okay, so I just found this subreddit and I can't get enough of it. Reading through all the personal accounts of high strangeness provoked me to share one of my own. I grew up in rural eastern Iowa. Farm country, fields, woods, small ass towns. I don't remember many, if any, talking about paranormal encounters in the community. But I had plenty growing up in that area, sometimes alone, other times while with family or friends. This encounter happened sometime around 2005. I was a freshman in high school and my older sister was a senior. We would often carpool since I couldn't drive yet, and it was a good 20 minutes to the town our school was in. It was autumn, and probably a Friday night. There had been a football game and my sister was driving us home after it wrapped up. Also in the car were two neighbor girls who lived in the area, and my best friend who was coming out to spend the weekend. I say out because I grew up on a large family farm fairly removed from my town. Although there were plenty of neighbors, 
The landscape in that part of Iowa consists of rolling hills, Grant Wood Country, and gravel roads. No street lights for miles, just yard lights at each farm in the area. The night was dark, and I remember it being warm. From what I recall, we were all jabbering and laughing and probably had the radio blaring. My sister was driving with her best friend in the passenger seat, I was in the back seat driver's side, my best friend was in the middle back, and the other neighbor girl was also in the back seat passenger side. It was a big suburban type thing. Like I said, all the roads are gravel in that area and fairly hilly. We came down over a hill that ends in a T intersection. Because it's gravel and on a downward slope, we would always slow way the hell down at that particular point. If you don't, your car would just slide forward on the gravel into the field. So needless to say, we were going fairly slow. We made a right turn heading south to drop off the neighbors. And that is when we saw them. Crossing the road were two large, vaguely humanoid figures. My sister slammed on the brakes, and for a few moments that lasted an eternity, and they were clearly visible. Illuminated in the headlights. They were two distinct figures, but they didn't really have any hard edges. It sounds weird, but they were humanoid and moved like two humans, somewhat quickly with limbs swaying, arms and legs, but also slow, kind of like they hovered or floated across the road. Visually, they were enveloped in a dense fog that glowed and shone from our headlights, like when a light beam hits smoke or dust or fog. Their cores were more dense, and they dissipated outward from there, visually fading. They were very tall, I'd say around 12 foot, based on our eye level inside the Suburban. From what seemed like a long time, but I'm sure it was just a matter of seconds, we watched them move up and out of the ditch, on the right side of the road, cross, and then enter into the other side, moving from right to left and disappearing into the darkness. The second they were gone, we all erupted in screams and my sister gunned it. Both my sister and her friends in the front seat had seen them, as well as myself and friend in the back middle. The only one who missed it was the girl in the back on the passenger side who was looking out the side window as it happened. When we slammed on the brakes and started screaming, she was like, what's happening? Because of that time dilation and her not noticing, it makes me think that it happened very fast. We all described what we had seen, and each person related a similar description to what I detailed above. Now, I've been fairly interested in accounts of high strangeness, cryptids, and the paranormal for most of my life, but I've never encountered a story similar to this one. The closest I've heard was on an episode of Mysterious Universe when they were interviewing a researcher about crop circles, and she mentioned seeing two towering figures glowing and enveloped by the fog running across the field. They also kind of reminded me of the scene from Prometheus when the astronauts trigger the projections on the engineer ship, and it shows a recording of two of them running down a hallway. That movie came out several years after this encounter, and I got the chills in theaters during that scene. I have other encounter stories, one even in the same exact spot, but nothing like this one. Looking forward to sharing more in the future. I hope you all like the recollection, and I would like to hear other similar encounters if they're out there. I live in southeastern Georgia, and occasionally while driving at night, I've seen these fairly tall, around six foot two with knees slightly bent, emaciated creatures with skin that looks like it was charred on the grill, leaving it covered in oil and black grit slash flecks. I can't remember their faces because the images of the rake look close enough to replace it in my memory. It seems to mildly match the description of crawlers that I've seen on the sub, but I've only ever seen them bipedal. I've seen these creatures three times, and these sightings are the only times I've felt real fear, and I've only seen them while driving and at night. The most notable time was the first one, while I was driving friends home with a full car. I round a corner to see what I've just described standing in the road directly in front of my car, and understandably freaked out. I blinked my eyes as a reflex as I hit the brakes. When my eyes opened, we had passed right through where it was and it was nowhere to be seen. I wasn't the only one to see it either, and after a second had passed in disbelief, 
The second we mentioned this thing out loud, I got an extreme feeling that we were being followed, doing 80 on winding back roads. I figured there wasn't much else to do as I had to get a pair of siblings home in minutes as they had a strict curfew, and we were already late. As we reached about four-fifths of the way there, the feeling of danger went from behind me to in front of me. And sure enough, there was a limping munchkin cat or kitten, its legs were barely three inches long, that was walking down the street parallel to the yellow line, exactly where my front left tire would have been. I managed to swerve out of the way as the cat just kept walking without change, and it was too dark to see if it moved after we passed. Before that night, I had never had problems with any animal in front of my car while driving for almost a year without it happening, but since then, almost three years later, I have animals almost committing suicide every week, and occasionally I feel that feeling again, usually when I drive that same road, as if I'm being followed. The second encounter was the scariest. I was again driving someone home in the same area as the other two. I didn't know him that well, but people knew where I was going. Halfway there, I could already feel that I was being followed, but I'd gotten used to that. I had never been to those parts of the woods before, but as soon as I got close enough, just being in that area gave me the only time I had ever felt true fear for my life as if just the consciousness of the woods outmatched a human one. It felt like a hive mind. After conveying this to my passenger who confirmed night times there have had scary occurrences, but not elaborating much, I pulled into his driveway. Pulling up to his door as close as I could, as his house was in a very wooded area and I didn't want him to walk too far. He made it inside, but as I was backing up to leave, I could feel the initial creature looking at me from behind, and then I saw in front of me a second one that was bigger than the first one, which I saw running behind a stand-up shelter, basically a roof with no walls, and it was fast. Even with my adrenaline pumping, it seemed to be going 25 to 30 miles per hour. Suddenly, the feeling of danger rose to the point I felt I was in immediate danger, and that there were more than these two. I tore through his dirt driveway back onto the dirt road entrance, and as soon as I turned out of the driveway, a dog jumped from a completely brush-covered ledge five foot above the road. There was a house in the direction it came from, but it had a fence around it, and I don't think even a toddler could have fit through those vines. And this dog was at least three foot five. It didn't chase my car or anything, it just stood there in the center of the road and barked at my car. As I was already too close to it to stop, I had to swerve around it. As I passed it, it just stared without barking, but I didn't dare look at it for more than an instant. I don't think I came to a full stop the whole way home, which was a good 20 minutes away. Thankfully, the third time was very far away. I just turned my brights on on a curve, again after dropping a friend off, and saw the same shape again. 1200 feet off, but instead of a charred gray, this one was a bright white. It was too quick to see anything else this time maybe three to six miles away from the other two, two miles apart. I have seen multiple animals that walk alongside the road as I pass, some disfigured and some moving slower than they should. I've even run across some scattered bones occasionally. The worst was on the way to church. I came to an end of one road to turn onto another on the route that I always take. There were four to seven dead birds lying around the white line all across the right lane, just at the stop sign, so that you have to enter the left lane to go around them. On my way back, three hours later, at eight at night, they were all gone. Not a trace of blood or anything. In a discussion with a friend during the first encounter, we settled on calling it a skinwalker due to the connection with the kitten, and that the aggressive behavior only started once we spoke about it. So I was about 10 when this happened, and it was the middle of the night, so please forgive me if all the memories are kind of fuzzy. It was the middle of the night, close to 3am. My great Dane, Annie, had to go use the bathroom, so I let her out back and waited by the door because it was very cold that night. 
I waited for a good 10 minutes before I started to hear her barking, which she never does. So I started to get a little worried and, like a dumbass, I got my jacket from my room and went to go get her. Now, to lay out my backyard, we have an off-ground porch and half an acre of land, which is cleared off except for the back half, which had lots of trees. And then there's the fencing, which, if jumped, leads to the mountains. I live in Tennessee, which I think is important to add. I crossed my arms and called her name a few times. She's a black dog, so it was hard to see her, but she whined and rushed back to me, almost knocking me off my feet. She stood in front of me defensively, which she had never done before or after this night. She was growling deeply and put all of her weight against me. I petted her, trying to calm her down. She looked down at the open porch, which was probably a good four to five feet off the ground, and she was barking like crazy at this point. Spit was flying out of her mouth. I had never seen anything like this, and this is when I pulled my old iPhone out and turned on the flashlight, thinking I would see a rat or maybe something else. This is where the memories get all fuzzy, so I do apologize. There was a face which was slim and had huge black eyes and a smirk. I couldn't remember its skin tone, but I want to say it was either gray or light brown. It had hair, which I think was blonde, and it was kind of slicked back, but it didn't look human. I screamed and quickly fell back, dropping my phone. I was about six feet away from the door, and once I got back up, I ran toward it and screamed for my dog. I heard a second whine, and when she rushed back to me, she had a slash over her neck. I slammed the door and locked it. I started to cry like crazy, and this is when my mom came down the hall shaking, and she had her pistol with her. Please note, we do live in a very rural area, and my dad works at night. She asked what happened, and I told her. She told me I was seeing things in the darkness and tried to tell me that Annie probably got into a fight with the raccoon. I didn't sleep that night or a few nights after. We took Annie to the vet the next day and they had no idea what caused her wound. They asked if anyone would try to hurt her and we said no. A few weeks later, I saw it again but I remember this event way better, probably because I had nightmares about it for a week. It was around 5 this time. I had woken up early because me and my family were going to go on a trip. I had gotten up to get some milk to try to get an extra hour of sleep. At first, everything was normal before I heard tapping at the kitchen window. My blood went very cold and it was so dark that I couldn't see what was at the window at first, even with the light on. I stood there, and it tapped for a few more seconds before just placing its hand on the window. It looked to be about my size, which is kind of small since I was only five foot at the time. I started to shake and slowly walked out of the kitchen, keeping the light on and my eyes on the window. Suddenly, it punched the window, making it crack. I screamed and ran back into my room and locked the door, screaming it was coming for me, and my little sister, whom I shared a room with. I hid under my blankets crying and I fell back asleep for a little bit. Somehow, no one heard me that time, and I never told anyone about what happened that night. Of course, as we were leaving, my dad said something about the window, but... He just thought it was because it was old and we replaced it once we got back. I've only seen it twice since then. Can someone please tell me what the hell I was seeing and if I should tell my grandpa who's a priest? And if anyone in Tennessee has had this happen to them as well? well thanks for reading and giving me any clues. Last year, when I was hanging out with some friends, I had the idea to watch some of those redacted videos with songs like Mr. Blue Sky playing over it. Well, one of my friends said he saw something that looked similar to something in the video. We live in northern Indiana, by the way. He said one night, maybe at 11 p.m. or so, friend one got a weird feeling, and he turned over in his bed and looked out the window. And to his surprise, there was something standing in the driveway of the house just across the street. He lives in the suburbs. He said it was about eight foot tall, white, emaciated, and had no discernible features. 
Scared, he closed the blinds and tried to shake it off, but to make sure he wasn't hallucinating of tiredness, he checked again. And this time it was standing next to a pole in his yard, which isn't too far from his window. Here, he closed the blinds again and tried to go to sleep. A couple of months later, I went to another friend's house. At night, we talked about scary stuff and watched some videos, and I brought up that friend one saw a creature just a few months ago. Then friend two said he saw what might be the same creature. Now, he's the type to stay up until 5 a.m. playing games or watching shows, so one night about midnight, he went downstairs to make some food. Here, he looked out a window in his kitchen and saw that thing standing in the backyard two houses down. He lives downtown. He described it almost exactly the same. About ten foot tall, white, emaciated, and no discernible features. But friend two said he actually saw it moving around, and he said it walked just like a normal person. Eventually, it stopped walking. And he said he didn't know if it was looking at him, since it didn't really have any features. And this scared him, so he ran back upstairs. After hearing both of them, having seen possibly the same thing within a couple months, and within such a short distance from each other, it got me motivated to try to find any other sightings. I couldn't find anything except for some comments made in a subreddit a couple years ago. They are as follows. The first user said, I have a friend who has had multiple sightings of a white, emaciated tall man with no discernible features in northern Indiana. The second user said, Do you have more info? I'm from that area and have seen it too. I found another sighting in Hobart, which is pretty close to my sighting. I'm curious to see if anyone else has seen it, and I'm curious to see what it is, be it an alien, skinwalker, or whatever it might be. I just wanted to add that they do live in two separate towns, and there's about 15 to 20 minutes drive between the two. Friend 2 also asked a friend to sketch what he saw, and I'll post it as soon as I get it. When I was younger, about when I was seven years old during the winter, I saw some things at my mother's place. I was always a believer in the paranormal, but I had never really seen anything bizarre or out of place. At least before the day that I finally did. It was about 6 a.m., and I was getting ready to go to school. I lived in the country, so I didn't have any neighbors close by, and so waiting for the bus was long and boring to me because I had no friends to pass the time with. It was still dark. The lights from the house were bright enough to let me see the yard and driveway, so I decided to play in the snow. I was making snowmen, snow angels, and... I also was beginning to build a fort when suddenly I felt as if I was being watched. It was as if time stopped, and it got eerie. I slowly turned around and froze. I saw a woman walking on the edge of the house. That woman, she was all white, like paper white and glowing. She was wearing a long white dress. She had long white hair, and she was very attractive. But why would a woman be in a dress when it was that cold? She stopped at her fifth step and looked at me. Beautiful bluish white eyes, small nose, and full lips. She smiled and I felt reassured, protected even. I had the courage to blink and in an instant she was gone. I never saw her again, at least not in real life. That was the first encounter I had. The second encounter was not so fun, but still not very eventful. I was watching TV with my mom when I was in high school. I had the urge to go to the bathroom, so I did, but when I got in front of the door, a black cloud was blocking my way. I stared at it for at least a minute before it was gone. Nothing really happened, I just got spooked, but... But then in 2016, I had some friends over, and they were big-time believers. We were outside talking and watching the sky when I started hearing some Native American music and chanting. I asked my friends if they were hearing the same thing as me, and they were. So we decided to check it out. We found absolutely nothing, except some quick moving shadows out of the corner of our eyes. And we were freaked out about it, so we decided to go inside. A couple of weeks later, we decided to look around the house again. That's when we saw shadow dogs. Red eyes piercing in the dark of their bodies. 
And that's not even the worst of my encounters, honestly. The worst was when me and my mother saw the same thing at the same time. UFOs. We've been chased by them for five kilometers. Of course, we were in a car, but that was the worst thing I've experienced so far, and that was the thing that made me move from my mother's place. This is my dad's story, but I feel that it's fairly interesting. This is when he was a kid, by the way. My dad was a kid raised in the cities with his brother and mom, when his mom would bring him to her boyfriend's dad's house that was in the country. When my dad and his brother would bring them up, they would be gone, but one of the nights through the week that they were up, they saw this alien figure at the window, but the window was covered with the blanket so they could only see the shadow of it. The next day, they went on as if nothing happened. That night, though, the exact same thing happened. My dad woke up his brother, and he saw it too. They had the idea to lift the blanket, and when they did, there was nothing there. But before they lifted it, they were sure it was there. They were obviously confused, but went back to bed. Now, a few years later, into his teen years, he's had a pain in his heel, and he had enough, so he cut open his heel and pulled out what appeared to be a microchip. But his brother never said anything about pain in his heel or anything. I live in a relatively large town in southwestern Virginia, and there's a lot of old rundown buildings and shacks that are usually unlocked and relatively safe to enter. I mean this as in the buildings still have some support to keep the house from caving in. It was the middle of the summer, and being the edgy teenager I was, a few friends and I decided to go to an abandoned house that was just on the cusp of the wood lines next to our houses. The neighborhood this took place in always made me feel off. I've had some really weird experiences there, and I've only lived there just shy of six months. I get my trusty buck knife, my buddy, and his sister's boyfriend, and we go toward the house. There's a small field before you get there, and the grass is never cut, so we had to take our time and tread lightly so we wouldn't get bit by snakes that are passing through. But with every single step, I felt heavier and heavier. I felt like maybe I should go back, but I didn't want to be a wuss, and my buddy and his sister's boyfriend were having fun and joking about it, so I play along. We eventually get to the house, and it hadn't been touched in years. I emphasize years, because there were boxes full of newspapers from the late 60s and early 70s that were still in place, as if the owner just decided to up and leave. We start looking around, and we're just screwing around doing what teenagers do, when we all stop and look at each other. I don't know why we all thought to do that. It seemed like we were waiting for something. My buddy cracks a joke, and we all just go back to what we were doing. We look around some more, and found an old Bible that was read regularly, a couple of broken glasses, and a shattered picture of a couple that was in black and white. I noticed it and wanted to take a look, but when I reached down to it, we heard a quiet whisper of, get out, and we thought we were psyching ourselves out, so we just continued on, but now I'm sure we were thinking about not touching anything, and we opened the door to what I presumed to be the bedroom. It looked like someone had stripped all of the flooring. After the door, it went straight to dirt, no floor, subfloor, anything. And then we look up and see a noose hanging from a beam from the ceiling. It definitely scared me. We didn't have a word to say. We all looked at each other and I shut the door. We didn't want anything to do with that room. The building was a two-story house and the stairs were still intact. But we noticed that there was shattered glass and blood on the steps. And we started to get really freaked out at this point but I decided to try to walk up the steps, and that's when I saw an old mason jar shattered in front of me, and a quiet whisper behind my ear that said in a low, menacing tone, Leave now. (laughs) I ran my chubby ass out the door with my friends following closely behind. 
I hightailed it through the field. I didn't even care about the snakes. We meet up at the end of the field at the edge of the road, and we look back at the window and saw an apparition slowly disappear at the front door. Me and my friends made a promise to never, ever set foot there again, and we haven't since. It's been six years since this occurred, and we're all still friends. We joke around about this now, even dubbing the Kemp House Ghost our road name, but I still get chills when I think about the words leave now. I've been empathetic my entire life. When I was a toddler, I would see shadow people who came out of the wall. I called them gorillas, but the gorillas never really did anything bad other than scare me. Throughout my life, I have continued to have many experiences, and this is the most recent. I was riding my motorcycle on an abandoned road. The road led into a state-owned conservation area. The area was thick forest and brush a very steep hill on one side, and a river on the other side, both close by to the road surface. I had been there many years before, because it was a teenage drinking and smoking party spot with a large cave. The cave had been explosively sealed by the conservation department after a series of violent crimes had occurred there. I have no idea why I wanted to revisit my teenage party spot. I stopped and viewed the expansive, beautiful scenery, I looked up at the steep hill, and a hundred yards up in the brush I saw what looked like a floating white plastic bag, or perhaps wispy cotton floating down through the trees. I watched as it came through the trees slowly, basically walking speed. It floated down directly at me, and as it got very close it appeared more like smoke. The smoke moved from eye level to ground level, floated over the top of my shoes, floated slowly up my body back up to eye level, around six inches from my face, and then just disappeared. I looked all around me, and it was gone, completely gone. I went home, and nothing happened for a few weeks. Then the knocking started. Knocking generally was in the TV room, and my wife and I just chalked it up to a somewhat frantic settling of the house. The knocking went on and on, Finally, I had enough and started yelling at it to stop, and it mostly did. I was concerned that that smoke had followed me home. I Google searched the area of the weird smoke and found an article, which was the same location and time frame when I was there. This knocking continued, but slowed considerably. I suspect it slowed because the ghost now knew it had contacted me, and I was aware it was there. The knocking generally followed me from the TV room to a second bedroom that I often fell asleep in. I slept in the second bedroom because I like to go to sleep with the streaming computer on, and my wife doesn't like the TV or computer on when she sleeps. In this second bedroom, this low-level activity continued for two more years. Then it went to a higher level. I heard someone walking into the bedroom, and I would speak to it convinced that it was my wife but no one was there. One morning I awoke, contemplating my coming day when it spoke directly into my ear. I repeated the vocal sounds over and over and over and came to the conclusion that it was just nonsense gibberish. When it spoke to me, I wasn't in any way scared. It didn't feel bad. It was very creepy, but I knew it wasn't evil. A few weeks later, I had fallen asleep and felt a tremendous pain in a small area and expanded like an explosion through my head. It lasted only an instant. I shook it off and started to go back to sleep. Then the footsteps sounds and a small toy fell off the dresser. Jesus, now I was wide awake. I opened the laptop and restarted the show I had fallen asleep to. The glow of the computer screen, the spirit started to manifest and became visible. I didn't sign up for that. Immediately, I left the room and went to my other bedroom. It didn't follow me. I racked my brain what it could possibly want, so I prayed. And then it came to me. The pain in my head was what he felt when he shot himself. The ghost needed something from me. It wasn't evil. It just needed something, and I suspected I now knew. I went to the bedroom. I told him how I was sorry how it ended. I prayed to the Lord, and 
I told him he was forgiven by the Lord and me. He should forgive himself now, and I told him that his family awaited him and loved him even though he didn't think so. From there, I personally felt a great relief. Now, that was two weeks ago. There have been no knocks since, and the story is absolutely true. It was either 2010 or 2011. My husband, at the time my fiancé, moved to Spokane, Washington for our jobs. No kids, only one cat. We moved into Brown's Edition Apartments. Most of their apartments were hardwood and had heated flooring. Not ours, though. We got an apartment with a brand new carpet and heated flooring, so win for us. When you walk on new carpet, it kind of makes a crunchy noise, almost like there's bags under the carpet. The crunching sound is most notable when you are lifting your foot up, not stepping down. The first incident occurred when my fiancé went to the spare room. Again, you can hear when someone is walking on the carpet because of the sound your foot makes. I asked him a question about the dryer vent, no response. I turned around, and he's not there. I yell his name, and he's still in the spare room, yet I heard him walk up right behind me on the carpet. I figure, whatever, and just go on with my day. About five months later, in the winter, I'm laying in bed reading around 1am, I just couldn't put the book down. I have a little reading light, and my fiancé is asleep and my cat is sleeping on my lap. Our bedroom door is open and I once again hear what sounds like someone walking around on the carpet in the living room. I lay my book down, and I didn't move. Kitty was sleeping, and I was just listening. It was like someone was doing circles in the living room, and then it stopped. Meh, probably the neighbors or something else. I opened my book back up and kept reading. About 20 minutes later, I hear it again, but this time it sounds like someone walked from the living room directly to the doorway before our bedroom. This time, I was actually alarmed. I laid my book down, and I see that my previously sleeping cat is now awake, alert, and staring directly at the doorway. My cat was woken up from the same noise that I had heard. I froze. I felt like my brain wasn't computing or understanding what was happening. But I felt this heavy weight of dread. And then I hear it again, and I cry out, what the hell? And my cat is now even more intensely looking at the doorway. I wake my fiancé up, and I make him check the entire house with me. Nothing. And the neighbors are asleep, and the world is just quiet. No more incidents really happened after that. We moved out in 2012. In 2014, an article was published in Spokane, Washington about those very apartments. You can even look it up online. Apparently, the brown edition apartments were built on a burial ground. I'm an atheist, and I don't believe in ghosts, spirits, or angels, but that story has always stuck with me as something I cannot explain. Last night, I was at my uncle's apartment watching TV. I had never seen this particular ghost, but I had had two encounters with another ghost, my grandfather. It was 3am, and I was still watching TV. I was watching a TV show called Animal Fight Club, and that's when I caught a glimpse of a small kid just standing there. Just before my uncle went to sleep, he told me the story about a ghost with cold hands, that when somebody went to sleep, he would touch them and they always described it as a cold touch of small hands. So when I first heard the story, and I thought it was 100% true because of the way he died, a kidnapper shoved him in the freezer. So that's where the cold hands come from. The kidnapper died three weeks later because he hung himself. The last week of life, he was in terrible shape. When asked, he said that he couldn't sleep because of his nightmares of a kid with frozen hands touching him. So, I had already had an encounter with that ghost, but this isn't the end of it. At 3.20am, I heard a whisper, my name specifically. I froze as cold hands touched my neck, then played with my hair, 
and finally hugged me. I got up and asked three questions. Are you the ghost with cold hands? And the reply was an instant yes. Were you murdered in this apartment? Again, yes. And have I done something wrong? And there was silence. No answer. From there, I decided that I needed to sleep, but he wouldn't let me off so easily. At 3.30 a.m., I felt a frozen finger touching my stomach, then my neck, and then my hair again, and then trying to force my eyes open. At first, I resisted, but then curiosity got the better of me. I slowly opened my eyes and met face to face with him. A smile was drawn on his lips, a smile that was neither sad nor happy, crazy nor logical. And then he answered my final question. No, I'm here to protect you from him. The kidnapper's ghost was looking at me from the kitchen. Considering I was the only kid in the building, I knew he was coming for me. I thanked him and asked a final question. And what was your name? And he said, the ghost with cold hands. And don't worry, we'll meet again very soon. So let's flash back to 2012. I was 12 years old and not a believer in any of this stuff. My parents and I were staying in my aunt's house in Hoboken, New Jersey. It was a three-story house that was extremely old. So old, it had a staircase that was used just for servants back in the day. Anyway, we're staying on the third floor, which always gave me weird vibes, but this summer night it got crazy. My parents took the only bedroom upstairs, so I took the small living room that had a leather couch and a small TV. I felt really creeped out that night, so I kept the TV on. I heard some footsteps in the kitchen next to where I was sleeping, so I got up to see if it was one of my parents, and I saw nothing when I flipped the light on. So I laid back down and I heard the footsteps again, but this time it was closer. I got up again, flipped the light, and once again there was nothing. But this time it felt like someone was looking at me, but I once again wasn't a believer, so I just went back to the couch and flipped the light off. The TV was still on, which casted some light. I finally got tired and let out a yawn and cleared my throat. Right after that happened, a voice in the doorway went, "Shh," and the TV went to a white static screen at full volume. I froze, and I felt something looking at me in the doorway, but I didn't have the guts to look. I felt it staring at me all night, and I remained frozen just staring at the static TV. Once the sun started to come up, the presence lifted and the TV went back to normal, and that had to be one of the scariest experiences in my entire life, safe to say. I've been a believer ever since. Have you ever met someone new and it felt like you've known them your entire life? I'm not talking about that stupid romantic love at first sight BS either. Like you meet someone and they look familiar, you can guess things about them to a T but you've never known them prior. I work for an insurance company. I'm the one who reviews the financial records for businesses to make sure they're paying for insurance premiums, workers comp, etc. Not a very exciting job but I've also been doing it for years so the pay is pretty good. So we hired a new person last year, I'll call her D. No big deal, people come and go, move up, leave, whatever. So I just thought it would be a new person that would ask me tons of questions at the beginning, talk to her in passing, meetings, and so forth. Nothing special. However, when I met her, she immediately looked familiar. So I tried to place her, maybe I've seen her at the gym I go to, a restaurant, or maybe she lives in the same apartment complex as me. So I don't think much of it and just go about my daily life. After a few days though, I get to talk to her more since I basically help with the job training and some of her mannerisms and the way she talks are so familiar. So I finally broke down and asked her where she used to work or live or 
about her gym memberships, and to my surprise, she wasn't even from this state. She moved from Tennessee to here in South Dakota because of a job opportunity that her husband was offered. I've never been to Tennessee, and she'd never been here. So, okay, fine. She probably just looked like someone else, or it was one of those deja vu moments. But it gets weirder from here. I start to think that maybe I just feel like I know her because we get along so well. She's very polite and also sly with her insults, like you may not even catch it. And when she's on the phone and she lets one slide, she always looks at me with her cheesy grin like, did you catch that? Which I find hilarious. I never really had someone I could do that with at work in fear of people taking it the wrong way. So I always had to just hold it in and share it with my husband when I got home. She's very intelligent. She went to a local community college for business, but she was super knowledgeable about health slash biology, or whatever you want to call it. The reason this is important is because I happened to call her out about it accidentally. I mentioned I was having issues with heartburn at some point, and I just figured it was because of the coffee I drink in the morning, or maybe what I'd had for dinner the night before, but she mentioned that I should go to the doctor about it as it may be more serious. It didn't really occur to me that it could be something worse, but I am a smoker, so I figured, eh, wouldn't hurt, right? Surprisingly, an insurance company has great insurance, too. So, I went, and come to find out I have GERD. This actually helped a lot to have an answer, and ways to help manage it, and also to get me to quit smoking. Anyways, I brought this up to her and thanked her for it, but I happened to make a comment how it was weird that she knew, and we both said at the same time, my slash your mom's a nurse. We both paused and she asked, did I tell you that already? But she hadn't. I just shrugged and said, eh, good guess, and moved on. But seriously, I have no idea how I guessed her mother was a nurse. The things I happened to know about her before she told me started becoming overwhelming. It kind of became a running joke between us that I must have looked her up before she was hired. I had guessed that she'd had an older and younger brother, or that she was a middle child. I guessed she liked painting and biking. I even guessed that she was in a bad accident as a teenager, and she made me guess where her scar was. I guessed it was on her right leg, but it was actually her left leg. The reason I guessed right leg, though, was because I was in a bad accident as a teenager and had a scar on my right, which also leads to the oddity of this. The reason I was able to guess all this, I feel, was because it was so similar to my life. I was the middle child. Older sister and younger brother. I loved painting, even though she was way better at it. My mother was a veterinarian, though, but some kind of doctor, right? I even moved here from North Dakota for my business and accounting degree, and met my husband here, so we stayed. We shared other similarities, and even looked similar. Long, curly, light brown hair, hazel eyes, similar build. Even our husbands look similar. Our views and opinions are dead on the same. We became so close that... I even went with her to Tennessee when her mother had an emergency and was in the hospital for a week. Again, I'd never been to Tennessee, but it felt so familiar. When we went to the hospital, I seemed to know exactly where to enter and what floor to go to before we even saw the map and set up. Now, how would I have possibly known any of this? Obviously, because of this, it has led us to become incredible friends. Sure, it's cheesy, but... We can even finish each other's thoughts and sentences like it's nothing. We hang out constantly. The four of us are usually together every weekend. We even tried to find an apartment close to each other so we could ride to work together. I'm incredibly lucky to have met someone like this, but then I can't help but wonder, were we supposed to be the same person? Were we supposed to be in different timelines and something crossed? Is that why I seem to know all of these things about her? I've talked to her about this, and she finds it intriguing, but had no knowledge on my past and couldn't guess any of it. Did I do something at some point that caused a glitch or a parallel universe of some sort to merge? Hmm. 
The other day, the strangest thing happened to me while I was driving my daughter to her grandmother's house so she could watch her while I went to work. It was pretty early in the morning, and my little girl was asleep in the passenger seat while we drove the back roads. I had the windows down and was just enjoying the light summer breeze. Side note, has anyone else fallen in love with driving in their city without people on the streets? One of the positive side effects of all that's going on, I guess. Anyways, we've been driving for a little while, and we're most of the way there, when this jack-off of a kid shows up out of nowhere behind me in what I specifically remember as a blue Toyota. He's tailgating super close and keeps having to slam his brakes every single time I slow down to stop. For several minutes, I'm just sitting there and watching this kid practice his rap career while damn near smashing into my ass over and over again. I remember he had a mostly shaved head, sunglasses on, and a bandana around his neck that I'm assuming he was using for some sort of facial covering. I also specifically remember that he had somewhere close to a dozen or two dozen of those little tree air fresheners around his rearview mirror. This all continues, his early morning rap career, tailgating, and me watching him lurch forward every single time I stop for a stop sign for several minutes. After a while, we get to what is the only real busy intersection on the trip to my mother's house. As I'm pulling up, I notice the light shifted to yellow, and while I probably had enough time to make it, I decided to go ahead and stop solely to inconvenience the idiot that had been on my ass for the last few roads. Yes, I know this was stupid, and yes, I know this is an aggressive driving maneuver and could have ended badly for me. And it could have resulted in injuries if we had been going fast enough. Sometimes, anger and emotions just make us do dumb things. I'll say this was one of my dumb things. Honestly, I wasn't going more than 20 anyways, and I didn't slam my brakes or anything. I simply came to a stop. So, still stupid, but that's my defense. So I stop, and I'm thinking that this kid is either going to slam his brakes or owe me a new car. To my surprise, he does neither. He gets over into the oncoming lane of traffic and guns past me to run the now red light. I specifically remember his blue Toyota passing me and heading into the intersection. I specifically remember a car that was starting into the intersection on one of the perpendicular streets hitting his horn. I remember looking down at my daughter and the horn waking her up. I remember everything down to thinking that my poor six-year-old girl was about to witness a potentially fatal car crash because this guy decided to be an idiot and I decided to stop on a yellow. But after a moment, there was no crashing noise and I looked back up at the road. The couple cars that were going through the intersection were going as normal and there was no crash. My first thought was, oh man, good thing they were able to stop on time. And then I looked up. I couldn't believe what I saw. The kid in the blue Toyota wrapping to his steering wheel was still behind me. 50 air fresheners and all. I stared at him for several moments in the mirror and he must have realized I was staring because he motioned at me like, can I help you? I looked back at the road, back toward the moving traffic, and then to my daughter. She was definitely wide awake at this point. When I asked her what woke her up, she said she didn't know. I asked her if she heard a car honking and she said no. Honestly, I don't know what the hell I experienced, but part of me feels like I saw some altered timeline where he decided to pass me and run it, but then I was pushed back into our timeline, or something like that. Honestly, it was just crazy, and I'm glad that what I thought happened wasn't what actually did. When I was a teenager living in Vienna, in the small country of Austria, I excessively played The Sims. I created all kinds of families there, with all kinds of crazy stories. Most of them were unrelated to anyone I knew, just straight out of my imagination. As the game got developed to the Sims 4 version, the details got very much on point when it came to creating your Sim. I was always very hesitant to create myself or anyone I knew, because I would feel bad if anyone died in the game, as they would portray my real-life people. 
I also didn't want to put anything out there, if you know what I mean, like, attract anything bad. With The Sims 4, though, I decided to finally create myself with a different last name, matching my Sims husband's last name. The husband was of color, as my celebrity crush was 50 Cent, I was 17 by the way, was wearing a black tank top, camouflage pants, trainers, and a black watch. They lived a happy life together, had kids, and I made sure that they died peacefully as I did believe in attracting situations. I met my boyfriend two years ago after I moved to London. We're in a very happy relationship. One day we were at a market and it was really hot so I bought a dress so I could change into something more light, and my boyfriend bought some pants in a thin material. He asked if I liked them, and I turned, and it was camouflage sweatpants. I said yes, and we proceeded to go home. We only lived a minute away to change. We changed our clothes, and my boyfriend asked me if he looked good. I finished dressing up and looked at him to check his clothing, and he was wearing a black tank top, the camouflage sweatpants, trainers, and a black watch that I had just bought him as a present a few weeks ago. I immediately realized that he looked like my husband in The Sims that I created years ago. I started laughing and told him, you look like my Sim. He looked at me confused, and as I told him what I meant, he told me, oh, so you attracted me into your life, with a cheeky smile, and I guess he was right. That was my most glitch moment that I've ever had, and I don't regret it at all. Edit, some extra information I forgot to mention. I also remember that I created the husband, and many other husbands for my sims, with the traits of an artist, as I wanted to have nice pictures in the house of my sims. My boyfriend is also an artist himself, and we have loads of pictures that he's drawn. If this is the Matrix, they really pay attention to details. So the other day, my husband and I had to go grocery shopping. It's a small town that we live in, as in blink and you'll drive through it small. So, of course, the store and its parking lot are also small. Because it's important to this story, I'm also going to explain how the parking lot is set up. So there's only two rows of spots and an area on the side of the building to park. The side area is usually used by the employees, as you can usually see them leaning against the cars, talking and smoking. Then, the two most front spots are handicap parking only, with three or four spots on each side of them. I can't remember exactly at this point. I parked in the spot furthest from the entrance on the right, looking at the building. I remember this because it was over the weekend, and it's usually pretty busy, so parking isn't always convenient. So I ended up waiting for a car to pull out, so I could at least be in the row closest to the building. As I got out of my car and walked to the left to enter the store, I noticed a sticker on the back of the handicapped parking sign. I specifically remember this because it was an avocado with the funny saying. It said something about don't be down in the pits, or something to that effect, which I found was fitting with our current state of the world. So we enter the store, do our shopping as normal, nothing crazy about it other than the price of beef, and start to head to the exit. As we are walking out, I went to walk left to go to my car when my husband stopped me saying we parked to the right. I didn't think much of it and told him no, we parked over here, to which he again disagreed. So to humor him, I said fine, started walking the other way as I grabbed my keys to set the alarm off to prove him wrong, and when it started going off in his direction, to the right. I stopped because I know for a fact we parked on the other side. I even went back to the handicapped spot to check the sticker and told my husband about the sticker as I walked up to it, as I remembered the saying. And the sticker was still there. I asked him how I would have known about the sticker if it was in the opposite direction. He just shrugged it off and said I probably remembered it from a previous trip, but I know that can't be. I specifically remember it because I thought it was clever, and I hadn't heard it before. My husband was also with me the entire time, so I know he couldn't have moved the car closer to mess with me, or just to be nice, and no one else was with us. 
The only thing I can think of is that it had to be a glitch or something broke. I haven't thought about this in years, and I don't know what made me remember this repressed memory of mine, but here we go. As a 15-year-old girl who wasn't the shiniest coin in the jar, I very much craved the attention of guys. I didn't date at all until I went to college, no guys at my school really showed any interest in me. The ones that I thought might never made a move either, so I found the Whisper app. On the Whisper app, you can anonymously post your thoughts and feelings where basically anyone around the world can see, as well as people who are only a couple miles away. In fact, there's actually a separate tab to look at Whisper from your area. You can heart people's posts, reply to them, or direct chat with the person. You can choose what info about yourself is available to be seen when someone decides to direct message you, such as age and gender. I chose not to make that information public. I don't remember what I posted, but someone had DM'd me. Their info didn't say much either, besides their gender. I was obviously very naive, and assumed that it was a guy my age who wanted to talk to me, because the words he chose and how his messages were written made him seem a lot younger. He asked some questions about me, like how old I was, my interests, what I did for work. I answered those questions, and he asked also to see a picture of me. I sent him a picture. He told me how beautiful I was and how I was out of his league. He would dodge questions about himself. He would say that he was boring and that he just wanted to talk about me. I eventually managed to get him to send a picture of himself. You guessed it. Mid-40s, man. I was surprised he sent an honest picture of himself, but at this point I very understandably freaked out. He then started asking to take me out to dinner. I stopped talking to him at that point, but he kept trying and saying stuff like, I'll take you somewhere really nice, I'll throw in a massage, winky face. I figured out you could block people, so that's what I did, and I didn't really think much of it after that. I basically forgot about the conversation after I fell asleep that night. A couple weeks later, I was at work and it was slammed. The checkout line was starting to wrap around the small store that I worked at. There was only one line, but two checkout registers at the counter at my work. I had just finished checking out a large order, and I kind of just looked up to see how bad the line was, and if it seemed like it was going to calm down anytime soon. That's when I made eye contact with a familiar face. I couldn't quite place it at first, and then the man smiled and silently mouthed, Hi, OP. The image he sent me in the chat immediately flashed into my mind. I felt my stomach drop in my heart race. I was absolutely terrified and really, really, really did not want to check this guy out. So I made sure to check out people way slower than I normally do. My coworker checked him out, but I could feel him staring at me. He even tried to wave me goodbye as he left, and I refused to even slightly turn my head in his direction. As soon as it calmed down in the store, I went to the bathroom and had a huge panic attack where I nearly threw up. When my mom came to pick me up from work, I very closely watched the side mirror to make sure we weren't being followed by anyone. After that day, I stopped answering direct messages if it wasn't someone who wanted to have an actual conversation about something I posted. Long story short, monitor your child's online activity. They may hate you for it at the time, but trust me, they need supervision. This happened when I was about six or seven, so around 2003. It had been the 4th of July, and my family and I were hanging out watching fireworks barbecuing, and all that fun stuff. Now, at the time, I had a retainer that was glued to the roof of my mouth because my teeth were becoming crowded and gave me really bad headaches. Anyways, 
My aunt had returned from the store to pick up hamburgers or something, and had brought back a bunch of candy for us kids. Except all the candy were gummy candies, and when you have a retainer like I did, you aren't supposed to eat anything like that because it could dislodge it. Being seven, I was pretty bummed because I was missing out on all the candy. My aunt noticed my sadness over the candy, gave me a little wink, and said that one or two couldn't hurt, and that she wouldn't tell my mom. Well, one or two turned into around ten, and I'm sure you can all guess what happened. Part of my retainer had dislodged. So I had this metal thing hanging in my mouth, and obviously I couldn't put my teeth together, and it hurt. I didn't say anything about it for a while because I didn't want my mom to yell at me, and I also didn't want to get my aunt in trouble either. So dinner time rolls around, and I'm not eating, since I have an awkward piece of metal hanging in my mouth and couldn't chew. My mom tells me I need to eat my dinner, and I guess the look on my face gave me away. What's wrong? She asked. My seven-year-old brain was searching for any excuse, but I had nothing. I just opened my mouth and pointed inside. She was not happy. My aunt stepped in and told my mom that she allowed me to have some candy and that it was her fault. My mother ignored her and was looking me straight in the eyes and told me, You know better. Well, we can't get this fixed until morning, so since you decided to make the wrong choice, you're going to have to deal with it until then. It was probably 8pm and the 4th of July, so there weren't any dentists open anywhere. It's now the next day, and my regular dentist didn't have an open appointment until the day after, so my mom booked one somewhere we had never been before. Enter Dr. Valentine. Now I want to note that I had never had any trouble with dentists before. I was a rather shy kid and I didn't like causing a fuss. Dr. Valentine asked my mom if he could give me sleeping gas, or whatever it's called. She politely declined and told him I was fine. I remember her specifically saying, just tell her what you're doing, she's good with the dentists. He did not follow those instructions though. My mom had gone to use the restroom, and his hygienist, who had been in the room after my mom told them no gas, quickly put a mask over my face. My mom came back in and she was pissed that they ignored her. From what I could tell, she moved on from it and the appointment continued. I assume what he was going to do was give me a numbing shot in my gums so he could go to work on my teeth, but he was being weird. I had not gone out from the gas, but I was groggy. He comes over kind of smiling and told me to watch the cartoons that were playing on the TV that was attached to the ceiling but I was aware enough to notice he was holding something behind his back. I did not watch the cartoons, and I'm just wondering what in the world is going on. He pulls this needle out from behind his back, at that age it looked like a huge sword, more than a needle, and goes to give me the shot. I just simply asked, what is that? Because he hadn't mentioned he was going to give me a shot. In that moment, his hygienist lays on top of me, I hadn't been in pain and I hadn't been anything but a good kid. I had only asked what is that. And then Dr. Valentine tries to forcefully give me this shot. I was confused by this lady that was holding me down and my mouth wasn't open enough for him to administer it. My mom freaks out at this point. Get off of her, I told you just to tell her what you're doing. Seeing my mom react that way scared the hell out of me and I started bawling. So what does he do after that? He tries to give me more gas. My mom said absolutely not and she had already told him no. Apparently he gave up on numbing me since everyone reacted badly to a lady holding me down and him trying to force a needle in my mouth. Weird that someone wouldn't like that, huh? I want to remind you there is no reason for any of what happened. I was not doing anything besides sitting there. He fixed my recliner and my mom talked to the person who was working the front desk and told her what had happened and it was quickly dismissed. She paid, and needless to say, we never went back, so thank you, Dr. Valentine DDS. I get crazy anxiety going to the dentist now, and actually have to take Valium. You are one in a million. 
I have only had good experiences going to the dentist since then, but I still get really nervous that someone's going to jump on top of me. We visited New York a few years back. We stayed in a cheap yet nice Airbnb with five-star reviews. The catch? It was far from Midtown Manhattan, towards the end of Wakefield. This wasn't our first time, so we weren't that spooked. I mean, we stayed in Harlem and New Jersey before, and we didn't encounter anything weird, in spite of their bad reputations. As a tourist, we always try to return to our apartment before 9pm, but that night, we got a little lost. We reached the station and boarded the Wakefield train past 9pm, Sunday nights so trains weren't that packed. We settled in the corner right beside a wall. Midway, a shirtless guy covered with blood enters the train. There were empty seats, but he just stood in the middle near the metal pole. He seemed intoxicated and couldn't stand up straight and was swaying a bit, and there was blood dripping from his fingers. He had cuts and bruises, but no visible stab wounds or anything like that. It made us wonder where the blood was coming from. One guy asked him if he needed help, and the guy answered in an angsty tone, Why do you care? We were hesitant to leave the train, unsure if there would be another Wakefield train. Also, stations in that area look sketchy at night. Imagine open-air stations with chilly weather. Either we die of hypothermia, or we get robbed. So we decided to stay, scared to trigger the man further. We kept our head down and avoided any eye contact. We were five stations away at that point. Imagine the anxiety we felt whenever a passenger left the train. Fortunately, we reached our station safely. We almost ran to our apartment and vowed not to stay out late ever again. I reported the incident to the MTA via their Facebook page, and they told us the guy just left the train in peace. This happened three years ago, when I was 21. I was walking home from the train station. As I was arriving to my house, I noticed this guy standing a house down on the other side of the street, standing behind some cars. He looked like your typical junkie straight out of Breaking Bad. He was wearing a hoodie and a beanie, and it was the middle of a heat wave in the Australian Sydney summer, which would be 40 plus Celsius. Anyway. I was living with two housemates at the time, a 6'2 Italian guy who was 26 and a short lady who was 24. I'm 6'1 and at the time I was 21 years old. I arrive home and a few minutes passed. I hear knocking on the door directly outside my window, and because I just got home I didn't really feel like answering it. So I waited a bit and the knocking persisted. I guess I gotta answer it, I said as I opened my bedroom door. I saw my Italian roommate just outside my room on his way to go answer the door. And so we decided to open it together, and as soon as we opened the door we could see this guy. There was a flash of silver as he quickly put something into the pocket of his hoodie, and he suddenly became nervous. His eyes were bugging out of his head. He was a far shorter guy than either of us, and very, very skinny. He asked if some person's name lived there. We said no, as we'd never heard of this person. He just wishes us a good day and he leaves. We close the door and I say, did you see what he put in his pocket? And my roommate says, yeah, the knife, and essentially confirmed what I was thinking. He left in a huge hurry, so either he was actually looking for the person he asked about and was thinking about hurting them, or he saw two significantly bigger guys answer the door at once and realized it was a bad idea. The story happened when I was a little kid in Trinidad. 
I'm not precisely sure of how old I was, but thinking about the car we had and the uniform I was wearing at the time, I was in the 6 to 8 years old age range. I'm 33 now, so this would have been in the early 90s. My parents had picked me up from school and were picking my sister up from her school. This was a daily occurrence, and most of the time it took a couple of minutes to get her and come back to the car. Most of the time, I just sat in the car by myself listening to the radio. This day, however, they were taking longer than usual. I started to get bored and was looking outside the windows when I saw a man walking down the street. This is the strangest part of the story. Something about him creeped me out, even before I could see him clearly. I wasn't a particularly fearful child when it came to strangers, and he didn't look scary at all. But every instinct in my little kid brain screamed at me to lock the car doors, so I did. As he came closer to the car, he saw that I was in there and he started talking to me. And then he started telling me to get out of the car and go with him. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't. I was so scared. Then, he tried to open the car doors. When he realized that the doors were locked, he backed up a little and started asking me to open the car door again. As he was doing this, my parents and sister came out of the school. My dad asked him what he was doing. He gave some generic answer and just walked off. To this day, I don't know what about him gave me that strong reaction I had, but I am so thankful for it. And that one experience taught me the importance of listening to my instincts. This happened to me about 15 or 16 years ago when I was displaced in Las Vegas after Hurricane Katrina occurred. I was nine years old at the time, and I lived in this cul-de-sac of townhomes. Without sharing all the details, this was the first time I'd ever had a friend who lived in my neighborhood, so he and I would often hang out from the early mornings to about 11 p.m. or so. One night, I can't remember how late it was, but it was pretty dark outside, while we were hanging out, there was this ice cream truck that was passing around. It hadn't turned on the typical music you hear when a truck approaches, but when I got near, it began to light up and play the music. My friend and I, who was the same age as myself, nine years old, approached the truck to see what it had to offer. I decided I didn't want any ice cream, likely because I didn't have any money to buy any. But my friend wanted some. He explained what he wanted to the guy, and when the guy suggested that he should get in the truck and pick out which flavor, and then he would give him the ice cream for free. For some strange reason, my friend was actually about to get into the truck when I yanked his arm and screamed something. Immediately after, we ran to our parents and explained to them what happened. After this, we'd have to be inside by the time the sun set, I can't say for sure what would have occurred, but I'm thankful neither of us got into that truck. I can definitely credit my parents for that instinctive reaction in this situation. They always stressed not to trust strangers, and all the terrible things that could happen if you did. Well, I guess instilling fear worked in my case. I have been an avid follower of Glitch in the Matrix stories for years. However, it wasn't until this year that I experienced any firsthand. The first was strange, and the second I simply cannot fathom. Several months ago, I was sitting on my couch watching Netflix. The living room was set up with the couch against the wall, with my boyfriend's recliner when seated to the left of that. For perspective, I must tell you that I am right-handed. So here I am, watching TV and browsing my Facebook feed, and I saw a meme which I clicked on to expand. When I'm finished looking at it, I set my phone down beside me on the couch to my right. 
I even remember the specific angle in which I placed it, screened down with the top of the phone facing diagonally away from me. I proceeded to continue watching TV for some time, maybe 15 minutes. I didn't stand up or even adjust my position, but when I reached for my phone, without looking, I didn't feel it. So I look again, and it isn't there. Confused, I search a wider radius on the couch and still do not find it. It isn't on the coffee table, and I'm not sitting on it. Before I stand up to search, I look to my left, and there it is, sitting on my boyfriend's recliner, in the back left corner of the seat. It's in the exact same angle as I placed it, but just not in the same spot. In order for the phone to have gotten there, I would have had to have stood up and placed it there, or at the very least get on my knees and, with the phone in my left hand, reach my entire body across the armrest of both the couch and the chair to place it there. I didn't move from my spot, and certainly would have had no reason to stretch that far to put my phone in an inconvenient place. When I picked my phone up, it was on the same meme I had been looking at before I set it beside me. It's as if I set my phone beside me and it went through a portal into the chair. The second event happened while I was at work. Now, I work in a small bakery. We have a shed outside for storage since we offer a lot of items and there's limited space inside. We have a rolling three-tiered metal cart to move items in and out to avoid multiple trips. On this particular day, I was prepping a wholesale order to go to a local grocery store. Most of our items are portioned straight from the pan into their packaging and bars, brownies, slash cinnamon rolls are packaged in plastic clamshell containers. So before I took the cart outside to load it up, I grabbed the sleeve of 8 ounce clamshells to put back in storage, certain that I would not need them that day. I make my way to the shed, store the clamshells, and load up the cart. I lock the shed and start rolling the cart towards the front door. The ground is super uneven, and you have to be careful not to jar the cart very much or risk all the items falling off. Well, I wasn't very careful and two items fell off onto the ground. First, a peanut butter brownie to the left, closely followed by a gluten-free cinnamon roll to the right. Annoyed at myself, I pick them up. Since I have dropped items before, I make sure to check the integrity of the packaging because they tend to crack. I'm glad I do because I immediately notice a crack in the brownie clamshell. To confirm it is broken, I test it with my thumb. It's definitely cracked, as I'm able to stick my thumb into the package on the front left corner. Not wanting to turn around, I make a note to come back for the clamshells I had taken outside, in order to repackage it. I set the brownie back on the cart, and make my way inside. When I reach the table where I lay the wholesale orders out, I start with the peanut butter brownie so I can set the broken one aside, but I can't seem to find it. None of the clamshells are broken. I think, okay, maybe I was mistaken and it wasn't the brownie. I proceed to check every clamshell, first the cinnamon rolls, since that was the other fallen item, followed by cream cheese brownies, oat bars, none of them are cracked. I check every item a second time, and this time, every corner of every clamshell pressing them to show any hidden cracks or holes, and there were no cracks. I kid you not, I checked every one of those packages no less than four times. I had only brought in the amount that we needed for the order, and everything was accounted for. I tell my boss, and she proceeds to also check the corner of every package. Nope, they're all uncompromised, and none were missing. We're both super confused, and I go outside to make sure I didn't grab an extra one, or Maybe it had fallen off again? I find nothing. Also, after trying to figure this out with friends, one asked if maybe I had repackaged it and forgot that I had already done so. But that's impossible. First, I had already stored the packaging materials outside. Second, I began checking the packages as soon as I unloaded the cart, meaning there's no way I could have repackaged it before unloading has honestly been weeks, and I still have no answers.
so I don't really know how to explain this, or even if it fits on the sub, or even actually what happened if I'm being honest, but regardless, I will try to relay the story. I was driving to work this morning, and I'm coming up a side street that connects to a very busy road in my area. It's the main road that stretches through, like, 20 towns. I get to the red light at this main road, and I sit there for about 15 seconds before seeing a car pull up behind me. As the car comes to a complete stop behind me, my eyes drift from the rearview mirror to the stoplight in front of me. It was red still. I then looked down at my radio clock, and it says 7.36. And this is going to sound strange, but... For a period of time, that seemed to stretch on for infinity. I kind of felt like this intense pressure all around me. Like I was zoned out and I couldn't clear my head or move my body because I was obsessed with the numbers I was seeing. Like I was in a trance or something. And it wasn't silence around me, but at the same time, like a very loud, pressing silence. I couldn't move, but I also wasn't trying to move almost like I was paralyzed with fear. I know I was frozen, but couldn't really process it or try to move. I don't know, I, I really can't explain it. Even now, it's just so confusing to me. After who knows how long of being stuck in this trance, suddenly everything snaps back to normal, instantly. The very first thing I register is that the person behind me is laying on their horn. I look up and see the light is green. I begin to drive forward, feeling completely 100% normal again. And once I get into the middle of the intersection, I sense this large presence to the left of me. I turn my head to look out my driver's side window just in time to see a huge truck coming right at me. It hits me and I could feel my body break. I felt and heard so many of my bones get absolutely crushed. Suddenly I am upside down in my car in so much pain that I can hardly breathe, covered in glass, and I can hear someone screaming. The last thing I remember before I passed out about 10 seconds later was seeing cop lights and distinctly thinking to myself, wow, how did they get here so fast? The next thing I remember, I open my eyes and I'm sitting at my car at the red light. The intense pain I felt a moment ago was fading fast, but it's still there almost like a ghost version of itself, if that makes sense. I'm intensely confused at this point, and I start looking around in a panicked way, and my eyes trail to the clock again. It says 7.36, and I'm just beyond confused. I know it wasn't a daydream, it was so goddamn real. I'm frozen in place staring at the clock, trying to figure out what the hell just happened. After about 5-10 to 10 seconds... I hear the person behind me start to beep at me, but I'm shaking and about to cry and so overwhelmed with leftover fear that I can't even react to it. They start to lay on their horn and I still can't move because I'm just so confused and frightened. Now at this point, I was starting to calm myself down and trying to rationalize what happened. I was beginning to convince myself that it had to have just been a daydream. It was early enough and I was tired enough that I even started to think maybe I just nodded off at the red light and dreamed the crash. What the hell else could have happened, right? If it weren't for what happened next, I probably would have been able to go the rest of my life believing I had fallen asleep and dreamt it. The moment that clock turned to 737, like the very second the numbers changed, a huge truck comes barreling through the light, definitely speeding. They ran their red light and crossed right in front of my car. A few seconds later, a cop, who must have just been driving behind the truck in the first place, runs the red light as well, turning on his lights in the process and beginning to pursue the speeding truck. They both drove out of my view within a few seconds. I was so shaken that I just pulled my car to the side of the road right where I was and sat there in silence for... I don't know how long. Like, what normal explanation could I possibly come up with for this? Really, there isn't one. I hadn't seen the truck or the cop car before they ran the light in front of me, so how did the dream crash that I had include those very specific and very real details? The entire area I live in is covered in trees, so it's not like I can see very far down the road in either direction. 
I know for a fact I did not see the truck or the cop car before I experienced the crash. I'm still so shaken. How do I rationalize this experience to myself? I feel disillusioned by something, but I don't even know what. I feel like I'm going crazy. I needed to share this with people who won't automatically dismiss this as hallucination or, or dreaming. I've known of this phenomenon for a while. This Fatum project and the whole concept of quantum immortality nabbed my attention, and it's been genuinely fun to think about. Like many of you, it's caused me to look into my life and see if there was anything that stuck out of the ordinary. I remember everything like it was yesterday, despite it happening close to a decade ago. I have scars that have stuck with me since, and I've only begun to really question everything about my accident. I went home with a friend of mine in middle school named Brandon. He was a buddy of mine that I went to school with, but our schools had our grades separated between two colors, gold and blue. I was gold team, and he was blue. All of our classes took place in a different part of the school, and we had different sets of teachers, meaning we never really ran into each other except for break and our weekends playing rec football together. I go home with him on a Friday, so I can go to practice with him, and so we can shoot the breeze during the weekends. His family had a few ATVs. They all lived close together, and almost every family member had one. We decided on Saturday that, after practice, we would ride them around for a bit. The first hour or so was me riding with him. I was slightly terrified with his speed, seeing as how it was one of the first times I was on one of them. Back roads, the highway, any road we could find, we burnt rubber on. I was terrified, but I ended up getting into it, despite not being the one to drive and having to hold on to him to avoid flying off the back. He gets tired of it. I'm confused why, but it is a normal thing for him, and it's something new for me. He knew I wasn't as ready to stop just yet, and said that I could ride his cousins. He knew I wasn't experienced as much as him, and he really didn't want me to mess his up. He told me what property his family owned, how to get back to the house, what roads to avoid, everything I would need to know, except one thing. His cousin's brakes didn't work. I don't know if he forgot about it or just forgot to tell me, but I sped off without any worries in the world. Everything starts out fine. The nervousness I felt was slowly dying off as I started to gain confidence. I got too cocky, and I decided I could start making turns at faster speed. I had to be going at least 40 to 50 miles per hour. I'm on one of the routes that he sped by, and a turn starts to come up. It curved like it was going into a circle. My speed left me unable to properly turn, and I could see the road fly right by me. I clutched the brakes in a panic, and look right up in time to see that I've beelined a course right into a tree. I had enough time to know what was about to happen, and I blacked out right on impact. I woke up in the middle of the road. The ATV was only a few inches from me, and my right arm was completely messed up. After focusing on my arm and clutching it to my chest, I looked to see how far away I was from the tree. I had to have been a decent 15 to 20 feet away. I cry out for Brandon, and within minutes he's there on his. He gets one look at me and the ATV and he is freaking out, saying that he had just gotten back to the house and he had left me only a few minutes ago. He's just as worried about me as he is about getting his ass handed to him by his cousin. So I go to the hospital, get my arm filled with pins and a cast for months. I still have the functionality, but I can't do the Spider-Man thing like I can with my left. What gets me though, and... I mean really made me wonder, is how the hell did I end up smack in the middle of the road when I remember whizzing past it? I didn't have a helmet or any pads on me, except for my football pads that I left on after practice. It was like I hit the tree, and instead of that momentum pushing me forward further into the tree line, it threw me and the ATV backwards. Now, I'm no physicist, but 
something about that one fact does not add up. I should have woken up surrounded by pine trees. So as I see it, there were two options. One, I hit the tree head on, died, and somehow respawned. Or two, I hit the tree at the speed I was going and won the lottery. Okay, so I've had this account for a while, but I'm not a huge Redditor. I was encouraged to post this, and after losing four hours to perusing the tales of others, I've worked up the confidence. I believe this does belong here, but I may be wrong. It's my first post, I do believe, so do go easy on me, please. Several years ago, around eight or so years ago, I was fishing in a boat with my ex. It was a quiet night and things were very still. This was during a four-year span of sobriety so we can rule drugs or alcohol out immediately. Anyways, it's early in the morning. I didn't have a cell phone then and in the chaos I forgot to ask him, but if I had to guess, I would say around three in the morning or so. The air around us suddenly chilled and I got goosebumps on my arm. We hear this wicked screech, like how I would imagine a pterodactyl would sound flapping its wings. Out of nowhere, this thing, I have no idea how to describe it, it had wings and looked very prehistoric, but wasn't really a bird. My ex saw it before I did, and when he stopped talking, I noted his silence and followed his gaze, and I found it. It was well over ten feet tall. I'm not a small girl by any means, I easily weigh enough for two people, but I had the sense it would be able to carry me off effortlessly. I couldn't even scream. It was a crippling fear that I had knowledge of this thing I shouldn't. Like, I knew it wanted to attack me because I wasn't alone, but had absolutely no reason to feel that way. We packed up and left. Somehow on the two hour drive to my house, I checked the clock and it was then 10 in the morning. Now, I don't remember that exact time we saw that creature, but it was absolutely pitch black. That time of year in the Midwest, the sun rises around 6 a.m. So, even if it was 5 a.m. or something, it wouldn't be 10 a.m. after the better part of a two-hour drive. I mentioned this to my ex, and he agreed it was weird. I'm hyper-aware at this point, and I begin noticing cars pulling off the road. They're looking at the sky, so I look too, and... What I can only describe as an almost cliché looking UFO was overhead keeping pace with the car. I say this because a static object would have gotten smaller, but for at least 15 miles this thing kept pace with us. A stopping when we did at intersections, and then resuming. I'm submitting this here because I don't feel a possible thunderbird or dinosaur sighting belongs in a paranormal subreddit. Likewise, a UFO story doesn't belong there either. These two events, coupled with missing time, is what led me to believe I should post it here. A fellow Redditor wrote a glitch story to do with the clouds, and it reminded me that I too had a strange experience. So one night, my friend and I were working in his shop, finishing up a job to be installed the following day. His shop sits catty-corner behind his house, about 300 feet, and then his property runs another 500 feet or so, to a tree line that is probably 300 feet wide, also with the tree lines running the length of the property. It was a cold, crisp Michigan night, with a bright moon and very sparse clouds. It must have been between midnight and 1am when I stepped out to pee and get some air. About halfway through, I glanced up and the oddness of what I was looking at hit me instantly. It was January, and the trees were deciduous, and completely bare, but the strange part was that the only clouds were running half the length of the eastern tree line, and it's as if they were mimicking where the tops of the trees met the sky. I don't mean like they were loosely following the line, but every nook and cranny to a T. They were synchronistic, as if the clouds were an extension of the trees. I was baffled, amazed and perplexed by this. 
I immediately thought, I need to go get my friend to show this to him. I hurried back in and got his attention, and in roughly 20 seconds he was outside and I was telling him, like, hey, check out the clouds, blah blah blah. However, in that short time, they were still mimicking the tree line but had started to separate from it. So me, feeling like a weirdo, started to explain how they looked when I first saw them. He was just kind of like, okay, and turned around to head back inside. No sooner than he did, he goes, whoa, and points now at the western tree slash skyline and says, you mean like that? I turn around, and now on the other side of his property, the same phenomenon is happening. I mean, every intricacy of the branches and tops of the limbs, there was a cloud sitting right on top of it with no separation, and outside of these light gray clouds, almost white from the moonlight, there was nothing in the dark blue winter sky besides stars. You could see through the bare trees as well, and easily see the clouds were not running behind them, just along the tops. Anyway, we stared at it for maybe 30 seconds as they drifted off, but if that wasn't some kind of glitch, then I guess the brain really does create what you see, which is a whole nother can of worms. So this event happened on October 7th, 2019, at 5.46 p.m., and I'll briefly try to describe it. I was on my way to running some errands, riding in my car while on the phone with a friend. I remember the weather being super weird, cloudy but hot. I don't really know how to describe it, but it felt like the air had some sort of heaviness to it. While I was talking to her, she said a few sentences to which I replied in agreement. Suddenly, she starts saying the same exact sentence she had just said 30 seconds earlier, only in a different tone and pace. It really sounded like she was repeating herself and not like the actual voice glitched or repeated, which is what made it even creepier. So, at this point, everything became fuzzy and weird, almost as if I lost sense of time. In the meantime, I heard my message's ringtone going off a few times through the earpiece, but I decided to check them later on. So I go on and tell her I'm pretty sure that she already said to me all of those things, and the most unsettling thing is that her voice would stop whenever I tried to tell her, as if she was actually listening, but would then continue on as soon as I would go silent. Without saying anything regarding the fact that she was repeating herself over and over, it was like talking to someone who was purposely trying not to answer. It felt really odd, especially considering each sentence was slightly different than the previous one, but the meaning kept on being the same. But that's when I lost her completely. The line gets cut off and I go to check those messages that I had received earlier. Turns out they were actually from her. Two of them were missed calls, and the last one said to call her back as soon as I could. I was still actively talking to her at the same time she was asking me to call her back. Definitely one of the most bizarre things that has ever happened to me. Okay, so I know this may justifiably make some people's eyes roll at the fact that this is a Ouija board story, but also hear me out. I still, to this day, don't really have a good explanation to this, and to this day I still feel weird about it, but I thought I would share it with everyone today. So this happened during the summer of 2010. I believe it was the summer between my junior and senior years of high school. At the time of writing this, it's been about 10 years. As most teenagers do in the summer, me and my friends hung out really late. Most of us were also kind of horror buffs, and used to mess around and try to find paranormal things around us. Ironically, we never really experienced anything all that strange, much to our dismay, until this night. It was sometime after midnight on one of those nights where it doesn't really cool off that much, even after it gets dark. Five of us were hanging out at the time, 
everyone's names aren't necessary except for one, and we're going to call him Charlie for the sake of his privacy. We decided to head back to one of our houses to relax and hang out. This friend had said that she had experienced quite a few odd and creepy things happen in her house since she was really young, and after sitting around in her basement attempting to cool off, someone suggested that we mess around with a Ouija board. Admittedly, I kind of sighed at this. I always thought Ouija boards were stupid, but my friends wanted to do it, so I figured why not. We did this whole setup turning the lights off and putting a candle in the center of the circle we were sitting in, setting the mood, you know? The basement wasn't entirely dark, as there was a small window close to us, and the light from the street came in from outside. The first few minutes were pretty uneventful. The piece didn't really move at all, and we asked all the basic questions a few times. After about ten minutes... We asked the question of, is there something there, and the piece started slowly moving. During this whole process, Charlie, Charlie's girlfriend and myself were the ones holding the piece. I can firmly attest to this day that it did not feel as though anyone was moving it. It's hard to describe, but it didn't feel like the way it would move if it was one of us sliding it, and it slid over to yes. We continued on and asked it a few questions. We asked if it was the spirit of a person that one of us knew. It, once again, the piece slid over to yes. At this point, things started to feel a little too real, and we all sort of looked at each other and asked if any of us were screwing around. Everyone denied that they were messing with it, and the tone of seriousness and hint of unease made me think that they were telling the truth. We asked several more questions, trying to narrow down who the spirit might be. Not all of them received quick answers, or even any movement at all. But when we came around to Charlie, he asked if it was a family member of theirs. After he asked that, it moved to yes, but a little faster than it did when it started moving. If there's something you should know about Charlie... It's that he takes his bond with his family very seriously. He's always been super close to his parents, his siblings, and all his extended family. In all the years I've known him, I don't think I have ever heard him say a single unflattering thing about any of his family members. It's this fact that makes me think that he wouldn't use something like a deceased family member as a tool for some joke or prank against us. Charlie's face got a bit pale after this, and the air in the room started to change. It almost started to feel like there was someone watching us, creating that sort of hair-raising unease. This may sound like a vague statement, but it's the best way I can think to describe the feeling. He then asked the spirit if they could spell their name. The piece started to move a little quicker again, and spelled out a first name and half of the last name. After it stopped, we looked up at Charlie to see his reaction. To our surprise, he had gone even paler and tears had begun running down his face. I asked him if he knew the name, and he just responded with, uh, yeah, that's my uncle. He died a little over a year ago. And that was when it really hit us that this was more than we had bargained for. Charlie said he had been really close with his uncle before he died. We asked him if he felt okay with us continuing, or if he wanted us to stop. He wiped the tears from his cheeks and said he was fine, and he wanted to keep going. Charlie's girlfriend asked, Are you here to protect Charlie? It moved to yes once again. We asked a couple more questions that we got mixed answers for. To be honest, after ten years, I've forgotten some of what we asked. Before we ended it, Charlie had one last question. He just asked, Will you sit next to me? Now, at this time, I had been sitting to the right of Charlie with a bit of a gap between us. After he asked that question, I felt a huge chill run across me, 
and the area between the two of us was significantly colder than the rest of the room. Keep in mind, at this time, it was around 3am on an extremely stale summer night, and we were in a basement that had no doors or windows open. This was hands down the most unsettling part of this whole occurrence. If I'm being totally honest, if I wasn't there myself and I hadn't experienced it, I probably wouldn't believe it if someone told me. It was equal parts surprising and unnerving. After this, we wrapped things up, turned the lights on, and composed ourselves. After hanging out another few minutes, we all went home for the night, shaken by what we had just experienced. To this day, the five of us have never actually talked about that night. It was just one of those strange things where we just decided to bury it in our memories. If I'm being honest, I kind of wish we hadn't, because it was such a strange experience that I don't think any of us could properly explain to someone who wasn't in that room. Unfortunately, many of us have drifted apart since high school, and I still talk to them once in a blue moon, but not on any regular basis. Most of us don't live in the same town we did when this all happened. Make of this story what you will, it's just been sitting in the recesses of my mind for the last decade, so I thought I would share it on here. Let me know if you think I'm totally full of it, though. This all happened at the beginning of this year. I would say sometime in either January or February. A friend and I were working the closing shift at a liquor store that he owned. I was spending the night stocking the shelves, and my friend, let's call him Bill for privacy, was manning the register and dealing with the handful of customers we'd had. This was a pretty normal night. Things were winding down and there wasn't much in ways of business that evening, it was around 12.45, and Bill had decided that he wanted to go ahead and lock up early so he could help me finish the stocking, and then we could cut out and get home a little bit earlier than normal. It had been a slow night anyways. Snow always caused the traffic to slow down for the store, and there was no reason for us to stay open for another hour if we weren't going to make more than a couple dollars. Missouri state law says we had to close at 1.30 anyway. We had one last guy come in as Bill was about to lock up the store. Bill explained to him that we were about to close in an effort to get the guy to change his mind. He said that he only needed one thing and he knew exactly what it was, and since he was a regular at the store, Bill decided to let him in. I heard most of the conversation, but honestly ignored the rest of it, as I was busy and I knew he could take care of this guy. Honestly, the customer was a decent dude, so I didn't mind if it took an extra 5 to 10 minutes. Anyways, I'm getting the boxes unloaded as quickly as I can, trying to just finish up, and I hear the door tone go off. We have these two devices that, if something breaks the beam between them, it makes a beeping noise. This way we always know if someone comes in or goes out. I stand up thinking that Bill had just let the guy out and locked the door, but to my surprise, there was no one there. I shrug it off as nothing, thinking that maybe Bill had either moved quickly or a bug set it off or something like that. So I go back to putting bottles on the shelves. After a few more minutes, I hear a loud glass smashing noise, like someone threw a bottle across the ground. This obviously freaked me out, so... I stood up and made a beeline to where the noise came from. When I got over there, I saw a bottle of rum on the floor halfway across the front area and shattered. I called for Bill to come out to the front, and he walks up, sees the bottle, and then looks back at me. He shakes his head, tells me I need to be more careful, and then starts to walk away to get the mop. I stopped him and told him that I didn't do it. He stared at me for a few seconds, clearly confused. I asked him if the guy that he let in had already left, and he tells me that he rang him up and finished that transaction around 10 minutes ago. I stepped toward the front door and pushed it, and it was definitely locked. At this point, 
we were both confused. There's no way that anyone was in the store, and I was at the other end stalking. And Bill was in the back doing closing stuff, counting the money, etc. After a few moments of confused silence, he tells me to follow him to the back. We get to the office, he gets on the computer for the security cameras, and he pulls the footage back a few minutes. In one of the cameras, you can clearly see me pushing bottles on the shelf, and on the camera that's near the front, you could clearly see the bottle edging forward slightly. After a few seconds, that bottle literally flew off the shelf and smashed onto the floor. There was no one anywhere near it. We both just sat there staring at the screen with our jaws wide open. After a few moments of being awestruck, I told him about the door beeping just before I heard that crash. He checked the footage from a few minutes prior, and sure enough, the little red light on the motion detector lit up as if someone had walked in front of it, but there was no one there. Honestly, this was the creepiest night that I'd ever experienced working there. There are a few more stories that I have, but none of them were nearly as creepy as this. But if I can think of some, I'll send them your way. This happened a few years ago, and this is the one thing that baffles me, and I've never been able to explain it. The house I lived in was fairly old. I believe it was built in the 1940s or something. I have to explain the layout of the house for this story to fully make sense. There was a small front room when you first walked into the house, kind of like a foyer or kind of sitting room, and it had an archway into the main section of the house. You could either turn right and there was a mini hallway. On one end of the hallway there was a computer room, the middle was a bathroom, and the other end, next to the front room, was my mother's room. Or, you could half turn left and you would be in the dining room and walking along the stairs. The dining room led into the kitchen, and next to it was the living room, with an all-open plan. The upstairs plan is completely irrelevant. Now for the actual story. It was the middle of the night. My brother was out of town, my mom was asleep, my dad was in the computer room with the door closed, and I was in the living room. As our house was old, you could hear everything. The stairs creaked, the doors stuck so often it made loud noises when they were opened. There were various loose floorboards, so you pretty much knew where everyone was at any given time. Now... I heard the front door open. I didn't think anything of it. I figure either my brother is coming home or my dad is going out for something. I don't hear the door close or anything, just open. Not something I realized at the time. I shrugged it off and went back to watching TV. I hear the computer room door open, and my dad comes out and looks at me and asks, Did you go outside? I'm like, uh, no. I figured my brother was coming home or you were going out for something. He points out that he's been in the computer room for the past hour or so. Despite the fact that I was in a place where I can usually see if someone goes upstairs, and he should have been able to hear someone from going upstairs from the computer room too, I decided to go up and see if my brother is home anyway. Nope. My mom's door is closed has been, and she's dead asleep anyways. Just to make sure, I decided to call my brother to make sure he didn't come home for like 2.7 seconds and then forget something. He confirms that he's over an hour away. We just brush it off, talk for a few minutes, and decide to go out to CVS. We get ready to leave, and I stop as I get to the front door. It's locked. No one else has a key to our house. The only keys were my parents and my brothers. I was too young at the time to have a key. So there's no explaining away, oh, maybe someone started to come in thinking it was their house and realized they were at the wrong one. As I said, my brother was out of town, and neither of us heard the door close, so we can't even try to pass it off as a prank. My dad and I both heard the front door open from separate rooms, 
with no explanation. Now, you may ask, are you sure it wasn't a different door? No, every door in the house had a distinct sound, and the way it echoed had a specific way. Maybe it was the door to a different house? Well, one, it was the middle of the night, and two, we lived in that house for ten years and we never heard our neighbor's door. Three, it had no muffled sound like it was from anywhere else. Also, my dad has kind of bad hearing. I've had no one who can explain this, and if anyone has any other ideas on how to debunk this, please, feel free. After grad school, I went to work in my city's largest hospital as a social worker slash discharge planner. And this was around 2008. The hospital was pretty big, and sections have been around for probably 50 years now, maybe more. Anyway, I'm sitting at the nurse's station one day to the neuro unit, which was in the older part of the building. Lots of staff bustling all around. I'm looking at something on the computer when I hear an older male voice right over my shoulder, close enough that it was almost like he was whispering in my ear. He says, Excuse me, miss. Can you help me? I quickly turned around, about to tell what I assumed was a patient that he needed to get out of the nurse's station, but there was nobody there. There were several nurses and CNAs near me, but all younger women. No men at all. No patients in the nurse's station. I had a crazy chill go up my spine and asked the nurses sitting at the desk closest to me if they heard someone asked for help. They looked at me blankly and said no before going back to work. I still don't know what to make of that one. Okay, so I recently moved into a new apartment about a month and a half ago, and ever since, there's been something here with me. I'm not quite sure if... I'm an empath, or medium, never looked into it. I just know that I hear, see, and feel things. So maybe my first week here, little things would happen that I wasn't too sure were actually happening because I didn't really pay attention to it. Like the shower curtains left open, cabinets left open, things moved when I know I left them in a certain spot. About two days after that, I came home from work, and it was a weird quietness. It felt like someone was just here before I was, and like they were hiding in the closet. I sat on my couch in silence, embracing the weirdness, and got dressed. I didn't think about it for the rest of the night. Another few days go by and I'm cooking. I hear my phone ring in the living room, so I go to answer it and then I hear a bang in the kitchen. I go back to see what it was, and there's a saucepan sitting directly in the middle of the kitchen, as if it was placed there, not like it fell and rolled there. This, this is where stuff gets weird. A few days ago I was having company and they were knocking on the door. I was in my living room watching TV, and I heard the first knock, then a second knock quicker and with more intention. I walked over to the door and asked them why they were banging on it. Then they asked me where I was just at. I told them that I was over in the living room and asked them why. They said no, you were just standing at the door looking at me and wouldn't answer it, so I thought you were playing with me because you walked away. This honestly scared the hell out of me because it wasn't possible. I tried to recreate what she had seen, but to no avail. She just kept saying it was me and that I was playing with her. I kept reassuring her that I would not do that. She said she banged harder because she didn't want to tell me, but she realized it wasn't me moments before I got to the door. A couple of nights ago, it was about 3.40 in the morning or so, and I had to pee. I opened the door to the bathroom, which I keep closed because it creeps me out, and I always feel like someone's watching when you walk past and I could hear a woman humming. It was subtle, but 
It was loud enough for me to hear. Strange things happen here, like someone will randomly say, What? I thought you said something, or I felt something touch me just now. But people don't think twice of it. I do, especially when I'm home alone. So this happened when I was around 8 or 9 years old. I think it was around 2010 or something like that. My sister was still in high school, and she bought a camera. Take note that she doesn't know how to edit or have any kind of filters, since that wasn't much known before, since we live in the Philippines. One night, we were having dinner and joking around, and then my sister told my father to take a solo picture so he made a pose that showed both of his palms. When my sister looked at the photo, my father's hands had a yellow outline of long, sharp claws or nails. My family was terrified. I wasn't fully aware of what was happening, but I did see the picture. My sister showed it to her classmates, and they said that it might be because of the camera or something, but bro, that picture was clear. Unfortunately, my sister deleted the picture. She doesn't want to look at that picture because it was always creepy as hell. We were living in an old house. It has two floors, but we rent it. We pay monthly. And my father thinks that it was built around 50 years ago. And that's where we took the picture. My cousins sometimes see a ghost sitting around the stairs. And he sometimes saw a white lady, also known as a ghost here in the Philippines. And a capre a very tall mythical creature that lives on old trees and likes to smoke. You can search the name, though. And he thinks he saw that in the backyard. Some of my neighbors said that they would sometimes see two old people standing in front of the house at night, and sometimes sitting on a chair, but we never put a chair in front of the house. We started to put a light outside at night, because of burglars, and on the second floor, I got really creepy vibes up there. Whenever I walked upstairs, I felt scared, and I had a feeling that there was someone or something up there that watched me. And I was really mad when my parents put my toys up there. I had no choice other than to let my toys be up there because I was scared and I would never go up to play with them. We lived in that old house for more than eight years. Surprisingly, we weren't harmed by any ghosts or anything. My parents said the ghost is probably nice and that they don't really mean any harm. My parents experienced more paranormal stuff when they were young, but that's a different story. I felt glad when we moved out, because that place was really creepy. And now sometimes I get dreams where I was in that house. Thankfully, it was always nice dreams and not scary. Or maybe I just forgot the scary stuff on that dream. Honestly, I'm scared as I type out the story. I get goosebumps remembering it. And I'm now afraid of the dark because my imagination takes over and makes me see scary stuff, even though I try my hardest not to think about it. Around six years back, my family decided to go to the Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia. At that point, I was still a skeptic, but this experience completely changed me to be a believer. So, to the story. My family took a vacation to Philadelphia, and we decided to go to the Eastern State Penitentiary. Nothing really happened, besides the temperature fluctuating quickly. It was slightly stormy, so I thought it was just that. So my family was walking through the main prison hallway, it was a while ago, so I don't remember exactly where it was. But I was walking past a cell, and I heard a knock in one of the cells. Each cell was locked, so there couldn't have been someone inside, but I hear it, and kind of peek through the gate and walked away. After a few steps, my left arm started to feel really warm, and then started feeling cold. Sorry for not saying this earlier, but I had a jacket on which was thick material, so I couldn't have got scratched through it. But when I took my left arm out of my sleeve, there were three long scratches going down my arm.
When I was 12, Mama and I became homeless. There was a waiting list of about six weeks before there was space at the local homeless family shelter, so we stayed with a really good family friend for six weeks in the bedsit where she lived, which is communal living with shared bathrooms, kitchens, and laundry facilities. I loved this, as Jay, the family friend, was fun, young, and pretty. She spoiled me rotten, getting me things to do and giving me lots of time and attention in between going to work. She also had lots of different people going in and out of her room at all times of the day and night. It was what some people might call a party house. Most of the people living at the bedsit were awesome. A lot of musicians, actors, and bohemians from all different backgrounds and cultures. <laughs> I made cupcakes with a drag artist who worked in a Soho club, painted with an artist using her materials to make my mama a picture, and sometimes a goth band who lived there would come and jam, letting me play their instruments with them. They were all lovely people, and a lot became quite protective of Mama and I. But there was this one guy, named R, who Mama was a little mistrustful of. R was around 25 to 27, tall, lanky, and really pale with brown, sad eyes. I was totally oblivious to anything major, but I always felt slightly different around him to the other people who came in and out constantly. The feeling didn't so much come from me, rather R himself, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it being 12. I was always an outgoing, friendly kid around everyone I met, but for some reason I was more reserved around R. Then, one night, it all kicked off. It was Friday, and my Uncle P had come to stay with us. He was 28, lean and wiry, but he looked like he could handle himself. As I said before, Jay, the family friend, was more like family to us. She's the youngest of my aunt's best friends, from the age of three, and had in fact lived with my gran, granddad, and their nine children when she was a kid. So my uncle, Jay, and indeed my mama, had all grown up together as siblings. That evening, Uncle P had made macaroni and cheese for Mama and me, and himself. Jay was getting ready to go out for the evening. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door, and someone saying, Come in, the door's open. Then, R appeared. I was sitting there scratching my uncle's back. Our entire family absolutely loved this activity. And after Jay told R that she was going out and offering him a can of beer, she went to get him one. Then R turns to me and says, hmm, I'd like my back scratched too, sweetheart. When R said this, I felt my uncle bristle and he scowled at R, and then there was an awkward silence. Then my uncle got up to get himself a can of cider, and R followed my uncle into the small kitchenette. There were muffled voices, and suddenly we heard my uncle say snarkily, You're out of effing order, mate. She's my niece and she's only 12 years old. Jay hurried into the kitchenette to try and calm things down, but the next thing I knew, R had run out of the bedsit really quickly, and my Uncle P came back into the living room with Jay close behind him, looking vexed. Nobody said anything else about the incident that night. Jay went out as planned. Mama, my uncle, and I had a quiet family night in. We played board games and watched TV. I did hear Mama and Uncle talk quietly about the incident after I had gone to bed. The bed was in the living room, divided by a really thick, heavy curtain, but their voices were so hushed that I could barely hear them. In the following weeks, the other residents of the bedsit tried to have conversations about the incident with my Mama and Jay, but the only people that Mama confided in was the drag artist and a biker guy who was really nice and kind and I was never really privy to those conversations. My uncle stayed another few weeks, and the four of us, along with the rest of the residents of the bedsit, had a good summer. I heard that R got nicked for drug possession, and I personally never saw him again after that night. The other residents talked about him probably having to move out because 
he fiddled their landlord out of the rent. And after six weeks, Mama and I moved into the homeless family shelter. I didn't know which sub to post this in, because I still don't know exactly what it was, human or something else. But here it goes. This happened six or seven years ago, but I still think about it occasionally. Some background information. About 20 minutes away from where I live, there's a large forested park with some historical significance. The exact events that occurred here are a little unclear, but it is understood that there were some minor Civil War skirmishes between Confederate soldiers and pro-Union German settlers. The area is supposedly haunted by those that perished during those skirmishes, particularly on one road that runs through the middle of the park. On this road, there have been several reports of sightings of spirits or hearing tapping on car windows when parked. There's also an old cemetery off the road in the forest. About 15 to 20 people are buried here, dating back to the mid to late 1800s. I'm a bit skeptic of the paranormal, so I'm not sure what to believe. Another thing to add, there has been evidence found in this area of satanic practices. Sightings of people carrying torches through the woods, also sightings of white hooded people walking through the woods at night. You should know who those are. Anyway, here's the actual story. Myself and four friends decided to go out there at 1am one night. I was 22 at the time, and was much more adventurous than I am now. We drove to the previously mentioned haunted road, and parked. Our plan was to walk into the forest and look for the cemetery. A perfect setup for some weird stuff to go down, right? Nothing creepy happened to us on the haunted road, so we continued to trek into the woods. The forest here is pretty thick but I remember we found the cemetery fairly easily with our flashlights and locating it on our phone maps. The cemetery was situated right next to a giant clearing surrounded by more forest. It was just a huge circular field in the middle of the thick woods. Again, nothing creepy happened to us near the cemetery. We couldn't get a good look at the headstones because the cemetery was fenced in. We got a little bored, so we started wandering around through the large clearing. One of my friends had a night vision camera app on her phone and was looking around with it. And suddenly, she froze and was focused looking at one area in the opposite side of the field from us. She alerted us and we all witnessed what she was seeing on her camera. There was a black silhouette of a person standing at the edge of the forest on the other side of the field seeming to be staring straight at us. My heart dropped into my stomach, and I started racing back to the direction of the road while two of my friends were still looking at the silhouette in the camera. They started screaming, It's chasing us! I couldn't believe what was happening. All of my friends started running in a different direction, not in the direction of the road. I knew this was the wrong way back to the car, but... I didn't want to get split up from them, so I followed them. We ended up running through a swamp and got lost in more woods to get away from whoever or whatever was chasing us. The GPS on our phone stopped working, so we couldn't figure out where we were for a good two hours. We aimlessly walked through the pitch black woods until we finally found a main road and got back to the car. I haven't talked to any of those friends about what happened that night. Like I said, I'm a skeptic, so my theory is that it was a person doing some weird stuff in the woods at night. Others might think it was something paranormal. Whatever it was, it was the creepiest thing I've ever experienced and has made an impression on me. Australian dude at LAX insisted that I eat a hot dog. I didn't know how else to sum it up, really. This was almost 12 years ago, and I had just had my first solo holiday traveling the USA. I had just finished my university degree in Sydney, 
and decided on a six-week U.S. holiday to see what my next steps would be. I had some family there, so it was great spending time with them. But this was also during the GFC, and so I was a bit stretched for cash on my return. So when I had the option of spending 10 hours in LAX or going outside of the airport like a normal person, I decided to become an Australian version of the Terminal. I didn't drink much back then, so I didn't spend my time at the bar like I would now, but I alternated between the charging stations and Maccas, McDonald's. I was so bored. I think LAX is a lot better now, but back then there was very little to do. Back then, pre-alcoholism. I was super fit, I was 21 and looked very baby-faced. This may be relevant. Eventually, I decided to go through security and wait by the gate. That was when this weirdo came along. I'll call him Gary because I forgot his name, and he kind of looked like a Gary. Is this the plane to Melbourne? Yeah, it is. Oh good, I'm in the right place. Yeah, you are. I'm Gary, by the way. Nathaniel. Nice to meet you. Likewise. I go back to reading, but he seems to want to keep talking. Is there any food around here? Actually, not really. You'll have to go back through security and get something from the food court. Oh, great. Do you want anything? No, I'm fine, thanks. I, I just ate. Are you sure? Yeah, thanks. It's a kind thought, but I'm actually pretty full. He then leaves. Another family arrives with a couple of teenagers and Gary returns with two loaded hot dogs. I'm not joking, but you have every right to be skeptical of internet stories. They're both covered in sauce and overflowing, dangerous drippage territory. I was really hoping he had napkins. He says, Here you go, and offers me one. Ah, thanks, but I said I wasn't hungry. I bought it especially for you. Thanks, but again, I'm, I'm not hungry. He shoots an angry look at me. Like, seriously, piss off, dude. I don't want to eat a hot dog in front of you. I get up and pretend to go to the bathroom to escape. I then stand away from the dude rather than sit back down. The gate was going to open soon anyways. He stares at me, and it looks like he offered the hot dog to the teenaged boy from the family. He was probably around 16. He's then talking to them, and they're laughing politely. I didn't have much to do with him, except he was still talking to the family who happened to be seated near me. He mainly talked to the teenaged guy and shoot me a weird glance every now and then. I usually stay up as long as I can to tire myself out, and then I'll try to sleep the rest of the flight, assuming I'm arriving in the morning at my destination. I couldn't help but feel like he got up to something while I was asleep for about six or seven hours. But I guess we'll never know. The dude was such a creeper, and I've never forgotten the weird interaction. It was honestly almost comical. Every time I've been back to LAX, I wonder if he's going to pop back up. He's probably in Melbourne now with a hot dog stand or something. Like many, I've been quarantining in my house in California, mostly spending the time hopping on work, calls, and gaining weight. A friend told me to post this story here, so here it goes. One night last month, around 10.30, I was eating dinner. I live in a rural area where houses are spaced farther apart, and the main town square has got to be at least two miles from where I live, in essence, the police department. So I get a knock on the door, that's pretty odd at this hour, but I open it anyways, expecting it's a package. And there are three dudes in these dirty yellow hazmat suit type things, with face shields as well. I was taken aback and mumbled something like, Uh, hello? One guy was holding a clipboard and he introduced themselves as a disinfection team sent by the county and that groups of them had been going around the towns in that county to inspect houses to make sure they're sanitized, etc, etc. I wasn't buying it, 
so I asked them to give me a minute to call my neighbor. I asked him about the disinfection team and he told me it could be a scam and to ask for a warrant or call the cops. I went back to the door and asked for a warrant and the men were gone. I walked out into my driveway baffled and glanced down the street. No cars in sight, just the warm night air. I contemplated calling the police but didn't think it was worth it. I went back inside, locking all the windows and headed upstairs to watch some TV. An hour later, I was still watching TV and I hear something fall over in my backyard on the patio. I heard it clear as day because the patio was below the bedroom window to my left, which was wide open. I was too lazy to check it out, so I stuck my head out the window to look around, and nearly died on the spot when I see those guys in hazmat suits messing with my back door. I reacted quickly, yelling, Hey assholes, the cops are on their way. That sure got his attention. He yelled something unintelligible and hopped the backyard fence. I saw the other two guys running from around the side of my house. They all hopped the fence and ran off into the woods beyond my house. I picked up my phone from the nightstand and dialed the local police, explaining the situation as I could still see their yellow figures disappearing into the woods. The cops came and we made a creepy discovery. The two guys who had been around the side of my house had been trying to pry open my dining room window with a crowbar. I asked them if they could check it for fingerprints and, I shit you not, one of the officers responded with, what do you think this is, the CIA? Honestly, that pissed me off. It seems small town police officers don't really give a damn, at least the ones where I live. The men had been wearing gloves anyway, so it really didn't matter. But let this be a lesson. I hope no one else will fall victim to this kind of... scam. This happened back in 2009, when I was around 13. I was visiting my mom in Utah for the summer and staying in her apartment complex. My mom wasn't the most stable parent, and she would often ship me off to her friend's place in a nearby unit when she was having an episode. It was around 10 p.m. on a typical hot summer night, and my mom shooed me off to Jane's so she could organize or clean the apartment. The apartment complex was a cul-de-sac surrounded by around eight buildings. Jane's apartment was catty corner to ours, so it's less than 200 feet away. I wasn't in any rush or worried as I did this all the time. As I got to the end of our yard, I noticed a man, probably early 30s, stumbling down the sidewalk opposite of mine toward the main street. I was a little surprised as I hadn't noticed him prior, but assumed he was drunk and leaving someone's apartment. I just brushed it off and kept going. I walked until I noticed Jane up on her second floor balcony. Her balcony was on the left side of the building, shaded by a tree, and her front door was on the other side. Once she could see me, I stopped and called up to her, and we were chatting about mom for a minute or so, and that she was happy that I was staying over. Suddenly, I hear a scuffle of shoes on concrete. I turn around, and the man that had previously been stumbling down the sidewalk was sprinting full speed at me from around 150 feet away. I immediately froze, completely in shock as I didn't understand what was going on. As he bounded toward me, quickly closing the gap, I turned and yelled up to Jane who couldn't see what was happening because of the tree. It was my first reaction and I really have no idea how that could have been helpful, because why am I not running up the stairs by this point? He was around 20 feet away, noticed Jane and took a complete right turn mid-sprint, and ran behind the adjacent apartment buildings. I took my chance and quickly ran up the stairs as fast as I could. I can never know for sure what his intentions were, but I definitely feel that if Jane wasn't on her balcony in that moment, I would have been a goner. I have two sisters, the oldest being 18, 
and we went to see Frozen the Broadway musical. We went via train on the way there and back, and we went there as a surprise for my younger sister for her birthday because she loves Frozen. So we took the subway, but that wasn't the main place where we experienced this encounter. We went to a better railway, or one that was just higher quality, and we felt safer on the way there and back. So when we were going back, we sat down and some pretty tall white dude, I would say around 40 or 50, maybe late 30s, with glasses, came onto the train car we were in, which was pretty empty, and then he chose to sit in the seat right next to where we were. There are these two seats which face each other, which can both fit three people. I was sitting next to my oldest sister, and the guy sat down right across from me, and right next to my middle sister. He held this brown paper bag, which may have had his lunch or something. He tries to start a conversation with one of us, which my eldest sister would have started to talk, but he didn't bring children or even his wife if he had one, which was a red flag to her, so she chose not to respond. Me and my other sister followed suit, and the guy tried to talk to each of us to no avail. And then the guy sort of pinched my middle sister that was right next to him. So on the next stop, we moved carts, but we stood next to the door beforehand for a faster exit. The guy just stayed there and said, screw you to us, and I glanced over to him for a few times, and I saw him just staring at my middle sister. We left the cart and moved to another one. Once we left, we reported it to the conductor. My oldest sister's greatest concern was me, because I'm really talkative and naive, to her at least, so... She thought I would speak to him and give away information, but I kept my mouth shut. I still wonder what was that man's intentions, and what was in that bag, and really am curious if he was just some psycho. So, a few key things before I get into it. One, I work the front desk at an internal medicine clinic. Two, all the phones are Cisco phones that have caller ID and a history log. Three, I've worked here for three years, and I know pretty much all of the patients extremely well. So well that our doctor will ask me if someone is our patient or not, because I can remember extremely insignificant details off the top of my head, such as a person's middle initial in their name. Four, I'm the only person who works the front desk, so unless I'm already on a call, I answer every phone call that comes into the clinic. 5. Because I answer every call, I know many patients just by the sound of their voice, especially if they call frequently. 6. The doctor I work for doesn't take new patients, so we don't have an extremely high number of patients. This is also why I know so many of them so well, because it's mostly the same people over and over, with rarely any new faces to learn. Seven. The patient in question during this event, I know super well, because he has the pseudo-bulbar effect where you cry or laugh in inappropriate situations. I worked there when he was diagnosed, and it's kind of a rare disease, so I remember him especially well, because he often has episodes in the waiting room while checking in, and I try to make him as comfortable as possible by acting as if nothing is out of the ordinary. I would say he's one of my favorites because he's a very sweet and very kind man regardless, and he's treated me with nothing but respect. Unfortunately, not the case for all of our patients. 8. Because of the pandemic and given that most of our patients come to appointments with no acute problems, the office is doing pretty much every appointment as telemedicine, with a few exceptions here and there, for things that absolutely cannot be treated over the phone. 9. Telemedicine here is just a normal phone call because the physician isn't very tech-savvy. The majority of our patient population is geriatric, so they really aren't tech-savvy either. So we don't do video chat or anything like that. And lastly, 10. The office is small. We have one physician, two nurses, and me, which is the front desk. And I work in a separate but very open room with a big checkout window and a door on the same side that stays open facing the desk that the physician and one nurse sits at. We can just talk normally across the room to hear each other. So, generally, I kinda zone out while the doctor is doing telemedicine appointments, but 
subconsciously listen for certain keywords or phrases that he usually says every single time before he sends the call to me when he's done to schedule the patient's next follow-up appointment. I'm halfway listening, and I know that he's on the phone and this patient calls in that I mentioned earlier with the pseudobulbar effect. We'll just call him Mr. L. And Mr. L says that he was on the phone with the doctor for his telemedicine appointment, but the call dropped. Not a big deal. This happens somewhat often. I said back to him, I think he's on the phone with someone right now, let me check for you, hold on one second. And I put him on hold. I was double checking that he was on a patient call and not a personal call. This doctor will literally talk on his cell phone to friends about everything in the world. Hunting, fishing, football, you get the picture. He's older and he doesn't really text, he just talks on the phone a lot. And he does this all the time, but he'll only call patients on the desk Cisco phone. So I see that he's talking on his desk phone, obviously to a patient, I assume. He would never make a personal call on the Cisco desk phones because our company records all the phone calls. And I picked the phone back up after being put on hold and said, Hey, Mr. L, he's on the phone with another patient right now. Just stay by your phone and I'll get him to call you right back. But when I picked up from hold, there wasn't anyone there. So I start saying hello a few times before hanging up because it was just dead silent. The nurse who sits behind the doctor on the other side of the room turns around to face me and says, Wait, who did you just hang up with? And I was like, uh, Mr. L, why? She replied back to me and said, um, because that's who he's talking on the phone to right now. Keep in mind, the doctor is still on the phone as she's telling me this, and she's telling me that he's been on the phone with Mr. L this entire time. I knew without a doubt from the moment Mr. L called in that the doctor was on a call already and was on this call the entire time with zero interruptions. Me and the nurse are just extremely bewildered by this, and by the time the doctor was done with his call and he sent it to me to schedule the next appointment, I asked Mr. L if his call had dropped at any point in time, or if he called the office in the last few minutes. For our telemedicine appointments, the doctor calls the patient, not the other way around. He told me, well, I dropped my phone on the floor, but I just picked it back up and kept talking. He seemed confused by my questions, so I didn't push it any further. Me and the nurse, who realized this, then checked the call log history, and it confirmed that the doctor's phone had a call with Mr. L for around 13 minutes without interruption. And my phone also had a call during that time from the same number. His first and last name also show up on the caller ID, and it was on both phones. I also confirmed with the doctor that his call with Mr. L was never interrupted, and he confirmed that it wasn't at any point. When I told him what happened, he just chuckled and said, Hey, we're living in the Twilight Zone, and had zero logical explanation for it. I also recognized his voice, and there's zero doubt in my mind that it was indeed Mr. L that I spoke to. So the only reasonable explanation the nurse that witnessed this and I could seem to come up with is that maybe in another dimension when Mr. L dropped his phone on the floor, it did drop the call, and when he called back, I answered in this dimension, but he was disconnected after I put him on hold since it was radio silence after I picked it back up. And honestly, if you have any reasonable explanations other than it was just someone else calling in, because I know that that was impossible, the call history log backed up, it was the exact same phone number, and I know it was his voice. Please do feel free to shoot them below. I'm honestly just mind blown by this. And while I was never disbelieving of alternate dimensions before, I was skeptical because of the lack of hardcore proof, but this has definitely convinced me. I should note that the nurse who experienced this as well said that she'd had a few other strange things happen to her earlier that day before this incident. First, she said that her son sent her a Snapchat saying, it'll buff out, randomly. She replied back with, what are you talking about, thinking he sent it to her accidentally. But nope, he said that she sent him a Snapchat of a huge scratch on her new car, and he replied, it'll buff out except there was no scratch on her new car. I guess you could say that maybe someone else sent him a scratch on their car, but he swears it was his mom's new car and she sent it to him. Second, 
Her boyfriend sent her a text saying, haha, that's so funny, to a meme she supposedly tagged him in on Facebook. But she said she never tagged him in one, and when he tried to go back and find it, it wasn't there. I will say that she'd mentioned these things to me before the incident above, but I honestly just brushed it off thinking that maybe they were just confused as these could be easy things to mix up. I don't think she just got excited and started making stuff up after what happened with Mr. L, because she mentioned it all before it all happened. However, since this is not my own personal account, I didn't exactly see proof of this other than the text message from the boyfriend. I'm not so quick to fully believe this and take it for what you will, just thought it was also worth mentioning. This is my first post, and I'll just say up front that I always look for normal and logical explanations before anything else. But this one has really been a challenge for me, and is one of the reasons I've been researching this forum. It may not sound glitchy at first, but the second part seems like it could be. Here's my story, and I'll break it up into a noise part and objects part. Noise. A couple of years ago, I was struggling with the worst bout of depression I've had since I was a teenager. My daughter is a teenager, and she lives with me full-time. This night was pretty normal, and I don't remember anything unusual before going to bed, other than the fact that it was winter and there was a lot of freezing rain falling. However, once I was asleep, I woke up to a very loud thumping noise at around 2.30 in the morning or so. I stayed awake with my eyes open in the dark, and I heard it again and again in what seemed like a rhythmic pattern. I thought it was from my closet, but when I turned in that direction I heard it from what sounded like the opposite direction. It was loud, and in a full-on rhythm now, almost like a heartbeat. Again, I thought of music, but that didn't really feel right, and I felt my fear rising. I started to think that maybe someone was trying to break into my house, or was pounding on the front door, but I wasn't sure. I was concerned enough that I turned on my light, and I got my gun from my safe. Again, the sound was in a full-on rhythm, and the hallway was dark under my bedroom door, which was shut. I opened the door, and quickly turned on the hallway light, and checked nearby rooms. Nope, nothing. Strangely, the sound had not really changed despite the fact that I had changed locations in the house. I started to worry about my sanity on top of whatever threat there may or may not be. I checked on my daughter, and I woke her up, and I asked her if she heard the noise. She said yes, after a few moments. Well, I guess at least I wasn't just hearing things. To speed the story up, we checked the living room, bathrooms, entry doors, all locked, the door to the garage, which was also locked. The sound was still there. I began to think it might have been the vent on the roof which had gone bad once before, and made some weird sounds in the hallway. So I got up enough nerve to disable the alarm and check the backyard, and look on the roof at my roof's vent. Here's where things started to get a little too weird for me. The sound could not be heard outside, at all. Nothing was blowing or banging on the windows, my vents were silently spinning, and the noise was just inside. I confirmed this by going back in the house, and the noise was still there. I then went to the garage, and I didn't hear the noise. The doors were all shut as well. I came back in, and we really tried to figure it out, and then finally the noise just kind of went away. We were very bothered, but after searching the house a few times again, we went to bed. It was difficult to get sleep after that. And then objects. Several days later, I was still a bit shaken up from the situation and had been researching what it could have been. I didn't have any answers that made sense. This morning, I went into the living room to look for the remote to turn the TV on. I was annoyed because the battery cover was missing on it, but I turned on the TV and moved on. I then ran across the remote again in another room with a cover on it. This was strange, so I went back to the living room and there was the coverless remote where I left it. 
Both remotes were identical Vizio TV remotes otherwise. Both worked on my TV, and we didn't have any other Vizio devices in the house. This bothered me more than normal because of how close it happened to the noise, but I was okay and just tried to work through it in my head. I continued on with my day. I opened a kitchen drawer to get a jar opener. We have one that came from a pampered chef's party. And my ex had thrown, so we only had that one. Well, not anymore. There were two in the drawer. At this point, I started to have an existential crisis of sorts. This all really bothered me that I had my daughter verify that she saw both of each objects, which she did. To make things even stranger, a third object appeared to have been duplicated, but I don't remember what it was. In fact, even almost right after it happened, I had trouble remembering what that object was every time I told the story or attempted to recall it. I just remembered that there was a third item and it freaked me out even more than the others. I still can't remember what it was no matter how hard I try. A few days later, I found out that my ex-sister-in-law was missing a remote to her Vizio TV. Yep, and it was missing a battery cover. I have no idea why it was at my house, but it did turn out to be hers. The other objects have never been claimed. I've never had any good explanations for these events, but I have one slight possibility for the noise. I had a friend say that her floor vents in her house flooded one time, and she experienced a similar sound. It's not a bad explanation, I do have floor vents, and there was a lot of rain slash freezing rain. However, it's never happened since, and I never saw water in the vents. Does anyone have any thoughts or any experience with something similar? Hi guys. Before I delve into this story, I'm going to give you some background information to help with it. I'm currently an apprentice electrician in the UK, and at the moment I'm working with my dad. He's training me up, and we have a contract at a set of leisure centers around where I live in the UK. He's had this contract for around 17 years now, and I've been helping him out since I was probably 4-5 to five years old. This information is mostly helpful to the story. Fast forward maybe a year ago, I finished school altogether and started working with my dad. We're at the leisure center, and we're working on the dry side of the building. It's split into two. Wet side is the swimming pool building, which I believe was built before the dry side building, which contains the gym, sports hall, and dance studio. They're connected by a bridge, which is over the side car park area. The dry side building is quite large. It's three stories, but rather tall. It's shared with a few other businesses, however the sports center takes up a majority of the building. I can't find much information on the building, but it was probably built around the late 70s or early 80s judging by the electrical system and panels installed, which have never been changed. Anyways, I've had this on my mind for a while. I remember around a year ago I was in this room that was uh, like some kind of storage room. It was tatty and looked like it was some kind of old shower room or toilets. I recall we went in to look at the light as it was still in use for storage and they wanted it working, as the control gear had failed on the light. The room had a load of old tiles, like typical cheap ones you'd find in the public toilet, etc., on the walls and traces of it being previously a shower room or bathroom. I asked my dad about it, and he said something like, yeah, these were the old male showers, or something along those lines. Anyway, we do the job and then we leave. I really think nothing of it, until I was thinking about the building and then thinking about why I can't seem to see this room anymore around three to four months ago. I was thinking maybe it was the room where the old electrical panels are, but it definitely isn't. They've never changed position, and the layout of that room has always been the same. I'm thinking about this for a while, and very soon after my previous job, I found out we were working mostly down on the ground floor. That 
floor hasn't got too much to it, as it's mostly occupied by another company. So I'm opening the door to this room, thinking this is it, but it's not. It's the main's room, where the entire building is powered from. I find myself going upstairs then, and looking for flashing LED lights to repair, as they've been reported in one of the changing rooms. So I take a little longer to look around this area. No trace at all. There's no room that was like the one I worked in around a year ago. So I ask my dad something like, Hey, where are the old male changing rooms located? You know, the, the room with all the old tiles in the wall and the showers. He looks at me confused and said something along the lines of, Huh? I don't know about that room. Taking into consideration that he's worked this building for 17 years, he did his first job in the contract here 17 years ago, and he remembers a lot of the jobs he's done over the years. He even showed me some other jobs that he did 16 plus years ago, so... I have no reason to believe he's unsure of the building. What's concerning is that a room has disappeared, and I seem to be the only one to remember it. Edit. I found a room very similar to this at another site that I was working at today. I never even knew this third floor sector of this site actually existed. My dad even knew all about it after I said, since when has there been any stairs going up another level here? Anyways, I never actually got to have a proper look, but I was pulling in some cable down into this corridor, and I came to the stairs to notice they continued to another level. I walk up, and I see it's the smaller sports hall balcony, which came as a shock to me. Anyway, I peer up and see this room with a window overlooking the small sports hall. It's clearly unused, and the walls are tiled and old-looking, like 90s era, and like the ones that I remember at the other site where I was convinced the room disappeared. I'm going to go up and have a look tomorrow. It's certainly the strangest place for a room, but the site was built around a similar time to the dry side. This was completely shocking to me. I wasn't actively looking for the room today, so this could be a breakthrough. On March 23rd of 2020, I delivered to a customer. I'm a truck driver. I'm required to be on the docks of my customer to confirm the deliveries. About halfway through the delivery, the receiver turns to the forklift driver and says to him, Hey, I forgot to tell you, but I cooked for my daughter last night. She was in town, so I had the pleasure to cook for her. And the forklift driver replies, Oh yeah? That's great. What'd you make for her? Oh, I cooked stuffed bell peppers. My daughter loves stuffed bell peppers. Meanwhile, at the opposite end of the dock, an argument is getting heated by a couple of younger employees. It's getting bad enough that it takes the three of our attention away from the conversation and our work, so I ask... Where's the supervisor? In which the receiver replies, He's not going to do anything. I don't know how he got the job. To this, the forklift driver says, I'm just glad that I'm nearing retirement. This time next year I'll be at home and not fooling with any of this. The next time I deliver to this customer is August 10th, 2020. About halfway through the load, the receiver says, Hey! And then at this point I get a very euphoric deja vu feeling. I forgot to tell you, but I cooked for my daughter last night. Now, I knew that she was going to say that. I know what the forklift driver response was going to be. It played out exactly the way it played out on March 23rd. Exactly. Even the argument at the opposite end of the dock. It was the strangest thing that has ever happened to me. Now, I've had deja vu, but, but that seems like you've been there before, but you don't know how it turns out. It feels familiar after it's taken place, but this specific moment, this was not deja vu. No, this was a replay. Facial expressions, responses about the supervisor and retirement. I almost wanted to change my question about the supervisor, but I decided not to. I decided to let it play out, but I knew about the stuffed bell peppers as soon as the receiver said, hey. Any thoughts? The OP left a comment I would like to add to this one. The feeling was identical. The best way I can explain the difference is that when I've had regular deja vu, it felt like I was being taken on a ride and I had no control. And please take this statement with a grain of salt, but this experience didn't feel like I was being taken on a ride. 
I felt like I was a god. I felt like I had this moment in my hands and I knew exactly how it was going to play out. One minute or less. For one minute or less, I had an experience that is well beyond my comprehension. Now, I'm not a very spiritual individual and I don't typically experience paranormal activity, but this? I simply do not know. This took place 20 years ago when I was 12 years old. Almost all of the details were kept from me at the time due to my age, so I didn't find out until much later what actually took place. My mother, understandably, still doesn't like really talking about any of this, as it was a really traumatic experience. It's only with hindsight that I've realized how genuinely creepy and horrific this whole situation really was. In early 2000, I had just started high school. We lived a little way from the school, so my mother used to drop me off in the mornings and pick me up in the afternoons. On the 15th of February that year, I headed to meet my mom at the usual pickup point across the road from my school, but I was surprised to find my grandmother waiting for me there instead. My grandmother told me that my mom wasn't able to pick me up, so I went with her and we picked my brother up from his primary school. My sisters were both away on school trips. We went back to my grandparents' house, and my nana and my grandfather sat us down to tell us something terrible had happened. Our mom's close friend, Vivian, had died the previous day. They didn't go into any details other than that mom was obviously extremely upset. We were upset too. Vivian was a lovely lady, and we had spent a lot of time at her house over the years. Not only because Vivian and my mom were close, but also because Vivian's husband, Andrew, was my brother's Cub Scout leader, and one of their sons was my brother's friend. At that age, nobody I had known had ever died, so it was quite difficult to process what had happened. We'd only just seen her the previous weekend. From my perspective, as a naive 12-year-old, the following days passed mostly without incident apart from my mother's obvious sadness. In hindsight, there was also an air of disquiet around her, but I didn't really clock it at the time. Around two weeks after Vivian's death, I was at home with my mother and brother while my stepfather, a barrister, was out for dinner with a client. It was early evening, perhaps 7 p.m., and I believe my older sister was at her boyfriend's house while my younger sister was at basketball practice. Our house had a large, open-plan, L-shaped living room, which encompassed the kitchen, living room, and dining room areas. My brother was playing in his bedroom, while I was sitting on the couch watching TV in the living room area with my mom. From that vantage point, I had a clear view of the front door. The security light on our front porch flickered on, and there was a knock at the door. My mother got up to answer it, and as she opened the door, she took a step back and visibly stiffened. Vivian's husband, Andrew, was standing on our front porch, asking to see my stepfather. I remember my mom explaining that my stepdad wasn't available to talk at the moment, and that if Andrew needed to speak to him, then it would be better to leave a message. Andrew clearly realized my stepdad wasn't home, and insisted on waiting for him. My mom repeated that it would be better to call another time, but he easily sidestepped her into the house and strode into the living room area. I can still picture my mom's forceful cheerfulness and frozen smile as he sat down on the couch opposite mine and asked for a cup of tea while he waited. Mom, still with that strange smile plastered to her face, asked me to make tea while she told V's husband that she'd call to find out what time my stepdad would be home. I made tea for all three of us, and sat back down on the couch, making awkward small talk with him, while my mom repeatedly dialed my stepdad's mobile number. He wasn't answering. Andrew was talking to me, but I remember thinking it was rude that he didn't seem to be paying much attention to what I was saying. His eyes were constantly flicking over to my mom, who was standing at the phone in the kitchen area around five meters away from us. The whole thing felt really weird to me. She eventually got through to my stepdad, 
and, still smiling, said something along the lines of, Uh, darling? Andrew is here. Yes, here. In the living room. Yes, he said he's waiting for you. You won't be long, will you? My stepdad was home within 20 minutes and convinced Andrew to leave with promises that they could speak on the phone the following day. I found out years later that my mother, stepfather, and the rest of their friends, along with Vivian's parents and brothers, all strongly suspected that Andrew had murdered Vivian. My siblings and I didn't attend the funeral. My mom felt we were too young, I think. But I later discovered that a police presence was needed at Vivian's funeral, which Andrew attended, because Vivian's brothers were so angry that there were concerns that they may assault Andrew, as they were convinced he had murdered her. That is how intensely people suspected him. And my mom was utterly terrified when he showed up at our door that night, but had been desperately trying both not to antagonize him and not to frighten me. It transpired that he had been interviewed by the police earlier that day, and it was pretty clear they were building a case against him. He wanted legal advice and potential representation from my stepfather, who refused. According to my mom, Vivian and Andrew had been having marital problems for a long time, and Vivian had confided in my mom, and others, that she had felt increasingly uncomfortable around him, and that his temper could be frightening for both her and their children. They were already sleeping in separate bedrooms, but he didn't seem to be accepting that the marriage was all but over. The previous weekend, she had told my mom and others that she was planning to officially leave him, and that she was going to be making it clear to him that it was over. Uh, she was bludgeoned to death with a steel rod in her bedroom on Valentine's Day, when she returned home from dropping her boys off from school. Having supposedly interrupted a burglary, though police immediately realized that this was obviously staged. The contents of the drawers from the bedside table and chest of drawers had been emptied out into piles on the floor, but there was no indication that these piles had been sifted through. There was no signs of forced entry and nothing was stolen. My mom and others believed that she had potentially rejected some form of romantic gesture, and he'd snapped. However, there was blood on the piles of drawer content, yet no blood on the floor underneath, which suggested the burglary may have been staged before she even returned home that morning. Andrew tried to cover up his crime by deliberately driving to a series of shops and obtaining receipts for small purchases and making inquiries with cashiers to build an alibi. He also originally claimed that he had visited a large shopping mall on the day of the murder and walked around there for quite some time. But two weeks later, presumably when he realized the police could check CCTV and find he wasn't there, he changed his story and said he'd actually been at a very popular local nature reserve walking and reading a book. Conveniently, there is no CCTV in any part of that particular nature reserve, including the car park. He was not seen by any other walkers in that area. He had come to our house that evening after admitting earlier that day that he had initially lied about his whereabouts to the police. He was arrested soon after. Andrew has never admitted to the murder and was found guilty on circumstantial evidence. From there, he was sentenced to 21 years with a minimum term of 16 years, meaning he may already be out on parole. I can't find any information about him online, however, I don't want to ask my mom about it as I don't want to drag up awful memories for her. Oh, and a few years later, Andrew also went through a phase of writing letters to my younger brother, who would have been around 11 or 12, from prison, protesting his innocence, which was creepy as hell. I don't know if this is that interesting, but it really creeps me out to this day. I was in sixth grade, and every day after school, I usually walked home up this hill. The bus stop isn't that far from my house, so I never really questioned my safety while walking home. I end school at 3.10, but usually get home around 4.30, and my mom goes to work from 2pm to 10.30pm. I never really knew my dad's schedule and every day one of my four brothers would be home waiting for me. That day I was walking home, 
and a man on a bike was riding on the sidewalk across from me. He kept staring at me, but I didn't think it was such a big deal at first. I started walking further and I noticed he was going the same way as me. My mom warned me that whenever this happened, I should call her or take the other route home because there were two. I didn't want to bother her, so I took the other route home, but I noticed that the man on the bike took the usual route that I take home on a daily basis. I assumed he was just a neighbor that I've never seen before, and then finally, I got home and I saw my dad in the garage talking to the guy on the bike. I felt this really weird feeling in my stomach. I said hi to my dad, and he introduced the guy on the bike as one of his close friends for years. Keep in mind that we were a close family, so I pretty much know all my parents' friends. I quickly let go of all the bad thoughts going through my head, and went on with my normal after-school routine. The next morning, I told my mom about it, and we saw the same guy that morning in our garage. Turns out, my mom has never seen that man before. If my dad and this guy were so close, how come my mom has never heard of him? For a few months, I kept seeing this guy around my house, and I steered clear of him. By now, he was familiar with everyone's schedule, so he knew when no one was home, and when I came home from school. One day, I decided to get off at my friend's bus stop so we could walk to 7-Eleven and get candy and snacks. Since I got off at her bus stop, I got home earlier than usual. When I got there, one of my older brothers were sitting on the steps because he forgot his keys, and he wanted to change before he went to skate with his friends. So me and him entered the house at the same time. The guy who was riding the bike was in the house, alone and stealing my dad's money and other valuables. When he saw us, he pulled out a sharp object. My older brother is much larger than him, so he quickly got the weapon out of his hand and held him down. I quickly called my dad and then he called the police. Everything got handled really quick thanks to my brother. They questioned the guy, and he said he was planning to rob us and then silence anyone who tried to stop him. Even though everything got handled, I still dwell on it. What if my brother had decided to go skate with his friends without getting changed? What if my brother couldn't get the weapon out of his hands? What if I got home at my regular time, and the guy ended up taking all my dad's money? My biggest concern is also... What if I had entered the house alone? He knew that I had already been cautious around him, and what if he purposely did this robbery right before I would get home from school? I don't know, but I still have all these thoughts. After that, we put cameras around the outside of the house to ensure that no one would get in unless they'd been invited in. Always watch out for strangers and follow your gut, even if your parents say the person's safe. And the OP added an update. First off, thank you to everyone who read my story, and thanks for all the questions and support. It's really brought me closure with this whole situation, knowing the entire truth. To start, no, my dad is not and was not a drug user or dealer, and he's never been incarcerated. I've asked him how did they meet, and he said they met when my dad was younger at his first job, when they were around 16, before him and my mother started dating. They were close friends for about a year until the guy started hanging out with other people, and they fell apart. When my dad was 18, him and mom started dating, so that would explain why she never knew about him. A few months prior to the incident, the guy and my dad reconnected through the guy's sister. She explained that he was having a hard time and fell in with the wrong crowd, his sister knew of my dad because the guy never really made many friends, and he always mentioned how my dad was one of his good friends. My dad, being a nice guy, offered to help him out, and they decided to meet that first day that I had walked home from school. The guy didn't own a car, and he lived in a motel for a while, which explained why he was riding a bike on our first encounter. The guy kept coming to our house for a few weeks because him and my dad were catching up. And like I mentioned before, my dad owns his own shipping business. He offered the guy a job because he knew he didn't have much money. The guy worked there for about four weeks, and my dad was paying him weekly to help him get back on his feet. Spending all that time at my dad's workplace and at our house, the guy adapted to our schedules. 
Even my mom got used to him being around. I also asked my dad if he saw the guy acting weird any time before the incident, and he said he noticed the guy asking a bunch of questions, and a few things went missing at his workplace where he had offered the guy a job. It's a shipping business, plus my dad's regular job is a lot to keep up with, so my dad just assumed that it was his fault that some things turned up missing. Turns out, the guy was stealing little by little until the day he got caught. I also found out the day prior to the incident that he asked all my brothers where they would be that next day, which is probably how he knew that my older brother would be out skating with friends like I mentioned before. I'm still not sure on if it was a setup so that I would be home alone with him. Keep in mind that I only arrived 10 minutes earlier than I usually do. Also, when me and my brother caught him, most of the money he wanted was already packed in a duffel bag. In 10 minutes, he could have done whatever he was trying to accomplish. As for whatever happened to the guy, I'm not sure, because I don't want to ask. It felt uncomfortable, and I didn't want to put my dad in that kind of situation. Keep in mind, at the time of the actual incident, I was only in the 6th grade, so around 11 or 12. They didn't give me much info because they felt I was too young, and that's the reason why lots of things were left out. I hope this clears everything up, and if you have any more questions, please feel free to ask. This happened a few years ago. I, 20 female, had just gotten into the Tinder scene, and was pretty new to the whole thing. One of my first matches I had was with a guy named Zack. Now that's not his actual name. But Zack seemed super cool and we messaged back and forth on the platform about video games, anime, and generic other things in our lives for about a week. Finally, Zack asked if we could meet up. I figured enough time had gone by and he hadn't given out any red flags, so I said yes. We set a date for the next day, and that was where I made my first big mistake. I gave him my home address to come pick me up. Looking back on this now, I realize how stupid I was to do that, and things could have gone a lot worse than they did. The next day comes and I spend much of my morning nervously getting ready for my first real Tinder date. Thankfully my roommate, Sarah, also not real name, was home with me and experienced the whole ordeal. About 30 minutes before Zack was supposed to pick me up, Sarah and I watched two cars pull up in front of our four unit apartment building. Three of these redneck looking creepy country men get out. They look to be around 40, so... Sarah and I paid them no mind. The next thing we know, we hear loud banging on the main doors. Our building is locked unless you're a tenant, so they clearly did not belong. Me, being as naive as I was, thought they were there for one of the other building residents and stupidly opened the door to ask them who they were looking for. The guy in the middle said, nah, we're here for OP. At that moment, I went from friendly too confused, too scared. I didn't like the way they were looking at me. I told him that I was OP, which, third mistake. He gave me the creepiest once over and said, Oh yeah, you look like your picture. This sent chills down my spine, and I demanded to know who they were and what they wanted. The guy in the middle said they were friends of Zack and they were there to pick me up for our date. I asked him where Zack was, he just snickered and said, <laughs> he's in the car, and pointed to the second car, which was strategically parked behind a tree, so I couldn't see if Zack was actually in there or not. Now luckily, I'm not that stupid. I told them that if Zack wanted me to go out to the car, then he could come get me himself. Then, the guy on the right steps up and asks if I would like to get with him. I went to shut the door, but he shoved his boot into the frame before I could close it. The man on the right said, Well, if you won't sleep with me, then sleep with my buddies at least. At that moment, Sarah comes out of the lobby and yanks me into our apartment and locks the door. They banged on the door for a few minutes and Sarah called the cops. They left shortly after, and we watched from the living room window as they got back into the cars and drove away. There was nobody else in the car. What's even worse is a couple hours later, 
I got a message from Zach saying, Oh, I, I'm so sorry about my friends. They took my phone and they thought they would play a prank on me. Don't worry, you'll see I'm a great guy when we actually meet. Yeah, I blocked him instantly and deleted Tinder. The cops couldn't do anything because I never got their names or license plates, so I never did find out what happened to those guys. This happened to me last night. For reference, I live in a college town. I, 21 female, was walking down the sidewalk to enter my friend's apartment building around 9pm, so it was dark out already. I had to park down the street a ways due to all the spots being filled up. As I approach her building, an older man, late 40s I guess, wearing a wife beater and dirty jeans steps in front of me facing me and gets very close to me while saying, Hey, baby. I'm no stranger to the occasional harassment, so I quickly sidestep him and go on my way. To me, it seemed obvious he didn't live in the complex since it's mostly occupied by 20-something-year-old undergrads. Now, in order to get to my friend's apartment, I have to take a smaller path to get to the back of the building. I was walking on that and I didn't hear him behind me anymore, but as I enter the more unlit part, I looked behind me just to check. He was right behind me. Not at a normal following distance, no, he was so close to me that I could reach out and touch him. And he was walking fairly silently, as I hadn't been able to hear him even though we were the only ones walking around. Now, I'm terrified at this point. I see some people in front of me on the stairs, so I start running toward them and into the more lit area. I was yelling, I don't know you, please get away from me. I began to pull out my pepper spray while still running toward the onlookers who were still on the stairs. He got flustered and ran away, and I was able to contact my friend and get inside. Even though he had left... The people who had witnessed this all happen ended up not even saying a word to me and going back inside. I'm not really sure what else they could have done at that point, but being alone while waiting for my friend to let me in made me feel incredibly unsafe. I held on to my pepper spray until I was completely inside the locked building. The OP did make an edit. Uh, thank you for all the support, you guys. It's both comforting and horrible to know that many of you have had similar experiences. I recently purchased a taser to add to my personal protection. Friendly reminder to always be aware of your surroundings and have a plan ready for if stuff goes south. There are some pretty unsavory characters out there. Last night, my roommate and I made a last-minute decision to go night swimming at the river in our city. It was around 8pm, so there were still a few people hanging out in the area, but it was quite dark. About 15 minutes after we got there, I saw a man shining his flashlight and seemingly looking for something near where we put our stuff. I said, hey, keep an eye on that guy, to my roommate, semi-loud and he obviously heard us and scurried away. I began to feel anxious, but I waited a little bit to say something to my roommate. Eventually I did, and we decided to leave. We packed our stuff up, and we began to walk up the staircase that leads to the parking lot, using our flashlights to see the steps. When out of the corner of my eye, I see a dark shadow dodge into some bushes at the top. I stopped and grabbed my roommate's arm and said, nah, nope, and started walking back down the stairs. I told my roommate what I saw when we got to the bottom, and she said it was probably just a tree blowing in the wind. I started getting the strangest feeling in my stomach that I've never had before, ever, and I just knew that if we went up the stairs, something bad was going to happen. I stood at the bottom and began to shine my light up to the top trying to see if I could see anyone, and sure enough, I saw the outline of a man for a split second. 
As soon as the light hit him, he ducked behind the bushes again. Obviously, I went into full-blown panic mode and started looking for other people that were there, hoping they could walk us to our car. Luckily, we found a couple not far from the steps, and they walked us to our car, but seemed quite annoyed about it. When we got to the top of the stairs, he was nowhere to be found. A few hours later, after we got home, I got a notification on my neighbor's app. It's the Ring doorbell app that sends crime alerts for your area, and it said that someone was stabbed only a few streets away from where we were. Now, I am 100% certain this guy's intentions were bad. I don't know if he was planning on kidnapping us or robbing us, but... I just know something really bad would have happened if I hadn't been paying attention, and we walked up those stairs. I'm not sure if he was the person that stabbed someone, but the notification just scared me even more. I still feel sick to my stomach because of all this. So, I've mentioned in my first post that my dad hunts, and this story happened during one of my many hunting experiences, which I never take part in and only ever heard about. Experience 1. Backstory, he used to hunt with a hunting rifle, but has now started alternating between crossbow and bow because it's quieter and easier to hunt than with a rifle. My dad, like I had mentioned, was out hunting and, I'm assuming, had fallen asleep in his car while waiting for a buck to appear. He looks out the window, and he sees this prize-winning buck, his words, not mine, a couple feet away from him. Excited, he raises his gun, all set to fire at it, because our other uncles have already gotten their prize buck, except him, and he wanted to get one himself. But, when he looks through the scope, There's nothing there. He lowers the gun and there's a buck in plain sight. He raises the gun to fire again. Zip. Nothing. Open space. He lowers the gun once again, and the buck is still there, but looking away from my dad. Very confused, he raises the gun up once again. Gone again. My dad is thinking, what's going on? He lowers the gun and this time the buck is really gone. He was so confused, and by then my uncles had returned to the car and they head home for the night. Nobody was able to figure out if the buck was real, or a figment of my dad's imagination, or possibly a forest spirit playing a prank on him. Experience number two. My dad was out hunting again with one other uncle at this newer area about three to four years ago, instead of the area in Experience 1. It was almost winter when this strange and creepy encounter happened. My dad was already high up in his tree stand for hours, and just waiting for a buck to appear. It does, but it's too far out of range that he wouldn't be able to get a clear shot. When he notices a woman in a white dress, walking around a few feet below him. He was confused. Why would she be walking around in a dress in that condition? And he wanted to call out to her but something in the back of his mind told him not to. He just silently sat in the tree stand and waited. Eventually, she walked away and out of sight, in the direction of where our uncle was located. My dad continues waiting for maybe another half an hour, before climbing down and calling our uncle about the woman in the white dress. Our uncle asks, What woman? He says, The woman that walked in your direction half an hour ago. The uncle says, I never saw anyone, and there shouldn't be anyone else out here but us. They were both confused, but it was enough to scare our uncle into wanting to get the heck out of there. My dad didn't want to leave, and instead wanted to stay a bit longer. After some convincing, our uncle talks my dad into leaving, where my dad proceeds to mock and tease him about the woman in the white dress. They both made it home perfectly fine, but our uncle is too scared to go hunting there by himself now after what happened. Then, a few days afterwards, my dad's leg just starts hurting and swelling up for a couple weeks. Our other uncle, who's a shaman, not a hunter, thinks maybe they offended or disturbed something while out hunting. 
My dad denies it, but was told to go back to the area during the day and apologize to whatever they may have disturbed. My dad, being the stubborn guy he is, refused to, but after a while, he and our uncle, the one who went hunting with him, went back and did apologize. A few days later, his leg was all better as though nothing ever happened. It was creepy, and that's why I never want to go out hunting or into the woods at night, because anything can happen, and I hate being outside after dark. I can't sleep, so I thought I'd write out this experience that I had a while back. Someone I loved very much passed away four years ago, and I was devastated over their death. The graveyard he's in is beautiful and became my spot. Before he died, we actually used to walk his dog there together. I would visit his grave for hours sometimes and read, listen to music, walk around, etc. I would go at night, a lot after I got off second shift around midnight as well. One night I was really upset about something and wanted to visit him, and I pulled in and drove over to his site, but something felt off. I get out of the car and immediately wanted to get back in. I have a really good intuition, and I tend to always listen to my gut, which has never lied to me. I drove back out, but you have to go all the way around the cemetery to get back to the entrance. As I got to the top of the hill, before the gate, which is still pretty far in, I see a person walking super fast, like almost speed walking towards my car. I jumped a mile. I looked closer and an older woman was walking directly towards my car very fast. She had a gigantic smile on her face. After seeing that creepypasta video, The Smiling Man, it became one of my irrational fears. It was pretty chilly that night, and she looked like she was only wearing a long sleeve shirt and pants. No parka or anything like that. The woman walked almost into my car, and then turned and walked off towards the woods on my right side. I drove farther toward the gate and looked back, and she was literally walking straight into the woods. Now at this point, it was like 1am, and the cemetery is not in a good neighborhood. It was bizarre. I drove out of there as fast as I could. My grandfather was my world. Whenever times got tough, he was always the one that I went to first. When I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and manic depression, he was the one who got me the help that I needed. He passed away in 2009. His home had caught fire, and although he got out before getting any serious burns, the smoke was too much for him. The only thing I have left is a picture of him from whenever he was a marine. It hangs on the wall above my couch, next to a picture of my grandmother, his wife, and my father, their son. Eventually, I stopped taking my meds, and my mental health started to go downhill. A few months later, and I'm not doing too good. I was in a very dark place. All I wanted to do was take that step and experience death's sweet embrace. Then, all of it would end. The pain, the darkness, the sadness. All of it would be over. Well, one night, I decided I was ready. I wrote my letters, opened a bottle of Jack, and sharpened my knife. I was in my living room on the couch, music blaring. I know it was probably bothering the neighbors, but screw it, won't be my problem much longer. I finish off the bottle of Jack and pick up my knife. I hold it to my wrist, and I wanted so bad to do it, it would be so easy and I'd finally be free. I was trying to convince myself to do it, just do it, just do it. The blade started to dig into my skin. My grandfather's picture fell off the wall and lands right on my hand due to the angle that I was sitting, causing me to drop the knife. I just look at his picture and I hear his words in my mind. You're strong. You are worth it. You are important. You can beat this, and I love you. At that moment, I started bawling. I can't explain it, but 
it felt as if a very heavy weight was lifted off my shoulders. It was like for the first time in a long time I could finally breathe again. I got back on my medication, and while I do still have some pretty bad days, whenever I get that low or have those thoughts, I remember my grandfather's words. I fully 100% believe that he was watching over me, and he saved my life that night. This is a follow-up story to my original story titled The Place Where I Live. A couple of years back, when I was in high school, I decided with my mother to rent a movie and buy some snacks from a gas station. It was 10pm, and we didn't live in a city or small village, just in the country, and the closest village was about 5 kilometers away from where I lived. So my mother was getting ready, and I was already going outside. I needed to go pee, but since I was already outside, I went behind a tree. I did what I had to do, then looked up at the moon, which was full at that time. But in the sky next to it was a, a strange light behind some clouds. It looked like a spotlight, kind of. Now, I knew there was a military base close by, but I don't think I could have seen a spotlight since that base was far enough. So I looked at it for a minute to see if it would move or something, and my mother was finally out and going to the car. She asked me, are you coming? And I said, hold on, and come and see this. She was thinking I was going to show her the moon, so she was a bit annoyed, but she came nonetheless. I said while pointing, do you see that? It's like if it's in the forest and look at the beam under it. We were mesmerized by how strange it was, but all of a sudden that beam under the bright light shot up and separated into four smaller lights, and they were moving erratically around each other, like if they were flies. My mother grabbed my arm out of shock and fear. My heart was racing, and I, I did feel like we were in danger. Then I said to her, get in the car, now. Usually I would take the time to move random stuff on the passenger seat so I could sit there, but this time I was too scared to do it. So I sat on the back seats, terrified. I was sure I was going to die and that those lights were coming closer and closer by the second. So we drove off ASAP, and I was looking around to see where they were. Is it normal for spotlights to move five kilometers? I don't think so. They stopped following when we were a couple meters from the village that was close by. Either way, that was the scariest thing I've ever experienced in my life so far. So this happened two days ago, September 19th, 2020. But for some backstory, I was at home with my brother's girlfriend's dog and my dog. One dog freaks out, like it has abandonment issues, every time that my brother's girlfriend, we'll call her Lisa, leaves. Lisa gets home from work around 11 p.m., but the dogs just kind of mess around, it's no big deal. Anyways, I heard a noise, like Lisa had come home, and whatever, and then like she closed the door. The dog started barking, again, I thought she had come home. It is important to note that I keep all the other doors closed, so the dogs don't go to the bathroom in the rooms. And I specifically remember closing my brother's door to his room. At 9 o'clock, I exit my room and my brother's door is open. I run to close it, and I see who I thought was Lisa sleeping underneath the blankets with the lamp on. She wasn't there when I first closed the door and the lamp wasn't on. So I shut off all the lights and went to bed. It was weird, she never said anything to me. She had just started a new job, so I figured it was a rough day, so she just went to bed. I asked my brother the next day if she was okay, and he was like, yeah, why wouldn't she be? So I told him what happened, and he's like, what? She came home at 11. I literally died inside when I heard that. I asked Lisa to confirm. She said the door was closed to the room and the lamp was not on. Then she told me she has a ghost that follows her and likes to play with the lights. I mean, whatever, I believe her, no big deal, but the thing that gets to me is who or 
What did I see in the bed? Hi. So, these stories are all from growing up in a house that is over a century old in a rural town in southern Virginia. It's a bit long. The earliest one I can remember is from when I was about seven or so. I'm 22 now. I had just gotten home from school, and I was home alone. My mom had taken my brother to the doctor, or something, and my dad was still at work. I guess it's important to try and describe the vague layout of the house. The fridge is in the utility room, which, unlike in most houses, was the equivalent of a sunroom. In order to get to the fridge, you either have to just come in the back door, or walk through the kitchen from the living room slash den. I went to the fridge to look for a snack, and looked outside and saw about ten figures that were entirely grey, and they had no faces. I learned during high school that these are called shadow people slash beings, and it's good that they were outside and not in the house. The next story I remember is from when I was about nine. It was Christmas Eve, and my dad and I were decorating the tree in the family room, different from the living room, this is at the front of the house. My mom was in her room wrapping the rest of the presents, my brother was at his dad's place. Now. It's important to say that my mom's bedroom was right above the family room, and above her room is the attic. We were almost done with the tree, and my dad had picked me up so I could put on the topper when he hesitated. I asked him if he heard the rocking chair, and he said he did. I put the topper on, and he set me down. We decided to go up and see if my mom had brought down my great-grandma's rocking chair out of the attic. We knocked on her door so she could hide the presents that weren't wrapped, and came in. She didn't have the chair down, so we asked her if she heard the chair. She hadn't, so we decided to check the attic. The rocking chair had a stack of other stuff on top of it, but it was rocking. Now the next one was really scary at the time. I was around 12. Half of the attic was converted into a bedroom for me to have more space. My dad built it, and let me tell you, he was great at making furniture and boxes and the like, but... Houses? Not so much. The floor was incredibly thin, and my mom could hear me walking all the time. I had stayed up late this night reading. I was in bed reading with the light on, when the door to the attic opened. I heard footsteps coming towards my bed, and then the imprint of a knee on the foot of my bed. I panicked, and I threw my blanket over my head and waited. Eventually, I could feel the pressure ease off of the bed, and I could hear the footsteps retreat. Then, I hear the attic door close. I pull the blanket down and get up to look at the door, and the slide lock is in place. On my way back to bed, my mom yells at me to stop walking around and go to sleep. The next morning, I asked her if she heard walking before she yelled at me, and she said no. The last one's short, and I don't remember it at all. This is mostly from my mom, so I'm not sure how accurate it is. I was about 14 and it was the middle of the summer. I had made a pallet on the floor to sleep on, and my bed was a loft bed, and the AC in that house didn't really work well on the second floor. I had taken over my brother's old room at this point. I was sleeping on the floor, and my mom burst into my room yelling, asking who I had in there with me, and me, just groggy and just stunned awake, asking what's going on, and trying to tell her I was alone. She said she heard a deep voice in my room with me, so she thought I'd snuck someone into my room somehow. But there was no one in there with me. 